Chapter 1. Rubber City. Don slouches back on his beloved emerald green armchair, slurping his third can of red stripe in his council house's living room, one that's rammed with tacky, 80s era decoration and upholstery. Yet to reach his desired drunken buzz, Don vacantly glares at the telly with a permanent snarl after another monotonous shift as Harvey Grill's assistant manager. On the telly, Ian Blackford erupts in a wily fit of rage, adamant that slimy old Boris Johnson has repeatedly misled the House of Commons. He demands the Prime Minister's immediate resignation. Deemed guilty of grossly disorderly conduct, he's ejected by the House Speaker Lindsay Hoyle, who does so while fighting back the tears in a historic Prime Minister's questions moment. Not that the cynical, non-voting, apolitical Don is moved in the slightest by the Scottish National Party leader's plight. Live landmark footage beaming through his 50-inch flat screen proves the last thing on Don's mind. Even if he had the slightest clue of its utmost significance, the no-show of his car park sweeper Sean Cont dominates his manic mind. Don usually has no issue turning a blind eye to the odd MDMA come down sicky, safe in the knowledge that others will return the favour. This one's different, however, and has wound him up something rotten. With the place already short-staffed today, Sean Sicky forced on into sending his stunning waitress out on car park duty, leaving him, as the senior member of staff, to begrudgingly prance around, waiting on tables himself for his first time on the dreaded restaurant floor in six months. No doubt Sean Cont will be recommended for the sack during his upcoming annual performance review as revenge for the traumatic inconvenience. This is far from the only contributing factor to Don's bitter inner misery. For the first eight years of his Harvey's tenure, he strictly forbade himself from gorging on their customary free staff meals. However, he struggled to resist such temptation as of late. Historically an athletic guy, a former county-level rugby player, gym rat, an habitual protein shake guzzler, he now finds himself piling on the pounds and deeply ashamed of his weight for the first time. As a result, Don's classic house outfit consisting of a tight bowl neck vest is starting to embarrass him. He glances down at his bulging belly and sighs. No longer can he deny becoming one of the lard ass, grisly ex-sportsmen he's always loathed and secretly mocked as an adolescent. He rapidly snaps himself out of the daze, utterly petrified of being caught off guard in a moment of pitiful self-loathing. Food's nearly ready. Don's wife, Sigrid, shouts from the back room, without so much as a glance to ensure the accuracy of her statement. Don scowls and rubs his dark, wavy, curtained hair. Oh, it's not though, is it? Slug at the wheel, he restlessly yells. Tired of squandering between 10 and 20 daily minutes of precious leisure time languishing at the table waiting, Don doesn't fall for the bait and switches over to BBC One Wales. A news piece plays on the local food bank, where a bustling queue bellows out of Bangor's gothic cathedral. Seldom do they do anything in Bangor, and Don's patriotic pride has him firmly on the edge of his seat. Tragedy actually is a more fitting word. There's so many in a traditional, proud area, full of crafters, who've dedicated their existence to pay taxes into a government we still have to be reliant on for the basics of life. Anyone with half a noggin won't be bringing children into this. An out-and-out North Walian old man Gwyndav passionately declares in a TV interview. Don nods, failing for a second to link his staunch social media-wide support of reducing the universal credit allowance and the consequential reality of old Gwyndav's austerity. A sudden, empathetic outrage surges within him, but so alien is such compassion that he brushes it off, unable to identify with the uncomfortable phenomenon. Suddenly, Don spots his stepson Chrissy Bray's distinct, long, thick black shaved sides mullet hair blowing lightly in the wind behind the interview. A gaunt, denim dungaree-wearing old man Howell stands nattering alongside him, squinting his eyes as Chrissy's thin, Black leather jacket beams the piercing sun's light into his alcohol and tobacco-induced wrinkly face. No way! It's Chrissy! Don manically shouts. Sigrid hurtles over with a grin as mischievous as the vast array of colours on her treasured dress. One of the last clothing stragglers from her adolescent hippie days. A phase that faded due to the malleability of her beliefs and character, depending on her perpetually interchanging inner circle. When it came to Don... She knew portraying the straight-shooting, subservient wife she could instantly sniff he deeply desired would win his approval. Despite some initial teething problems during her transition into the role, 
She did enough to swipe Don's glittery, MDMA fueled affection on their first meeting under Copperfest Festival's hardstyle tent seven years ago. As she cottons on to the location of her eldest son's accidental TV appearance, her glee rapidly evaporates. Don cackles. Dickhead! What's he doing there, man? Don's buzz haircut, nine-year-old son Gav scampers over with a smirk, as smug as his entitled personality. Wanting in on the family glee, Chrissy's darkly dressed, 12-year-old half-brother Sid trudges over. Before catching a sneaky glimpse of the big screen from a safe distance, Don swivels around and glares at him. That stir-fry's rubber city again, and you're paying for the takeaway. And it will not be a stingy one, Don bitterly warns. Sid rustles his blonde streak dark hair. The very first haircut his painfully controlling mothers let him pick, before huffing his way back towards the kitchen. Don's disdain for Sid is no secret, with a rigid lad's lad perception of how people should look. Sporting what Don deems a feminine haircut has only sunk Sid to new lows in his estimation. Look at matey there, Don points at Howell's eccentric outfit with a censorious grimace. A proper weirdo, Gav remarks. What's he fucking doing with him? Don holds out his hands in histrionic bewilderment. Maybe he's a gay boy now, yeah, Dad? Gav says after a moment of deep consideration, mustering every ounce of his four years of playground logic at a chronically discriminatory public school. Might be on to some in there, Gav. He's not, Sigrid defiantly insists. Ban it like that, you just never know, Don estimates. Desperate to push his original theory linking Chrissy's haircut history, including a four-year top-knot phase, to probable homosexuality. Sigrid's eyes wickedly narrow as she clenches her teeth. With respect, I think I'd know that about my own son. No longer asks you for dough though, does he? Don't do fuck all that we know for it. Blokes like that, they'll give him, I reckon. Don strokes his chin as the sums whittle through his thick skull. Quarter of their food bank for a blowy. Half of it full works. Whole shebang for an overnighter. Sigrid reverts her focus to the tally, ponders internally, grunts, shakes her head and furiously storms out of the room. Already passively enraged at having been disturbed from her rigid, obsessive compulsive disorder fuel chore schedule. Not that she'd dare tell Don. About that, or the litany of inner marital bits and bobs rattling her fiercely codependent cage. Don cups his head. Horrified to see Howell presents his farmer's cap to Chrissy. Look, hat the lot. At least we know where you get it from now, Sid. Mystery solved. Sid looks Don straight in the face with an eerie, vacant air. Seeing through this veil, and satisfied with his ribbing success, Don slowly turns away with a brimming, wry smirk. No sooner as he does, Sid quietly spits in the duck noodle stir-fry he's making over the hob. At the food bank, Chrissy stood in front of Howell, whose farmer's cap has now been outstretched and presented for an awkward minute. Who keeps a tenor in their cap? Chrissy bluntly asks. Howell impatiently flitters his eyes. Gonna leave me study like a prick or what? This is Howell's first splurge on Chrissy's hash. Never before in 45 years of smoking as he shopped elsewhere of his old school buddy Trent Bonk. After dealing weed... Hash and knockout strength weed caramel shortbreads for 50 years without so much as a stint on tag. Old Trent got abruptly slapped with a two year prison sentence last month. In turn, forcing Howell resentfully out of his comfort zone and into the unpredictable game of scoring off scatty adolescents. Chrissy picks a two and a half gram bag of low grade hash, locally known as Rocky, out from his thigh length, black leather jacket inside pocket, abrasively snatches the tenor, and carefully places the hash in Howell's hat. Arcloy, none of the old school subtlety these days, there. Howell sternly gazes over at the BBC cameras and interviewee. Chrissy blushes and darts off in a flash, which is just as well, with being precisely 11 minutes late for the next stop. A shortcut's the only option to avoid a barrage of missed calls that will drain his precarious iPhone 5 battery and scup a potential business. As he stumbles down the rough, boggy Banger Mountain path, Skinny, ginger-haired banger tick merchant Nebo tensely awaits, beckoning Chrissy down. An almighty five-crate-deep two-borg sesh with tear-away locals half his age has proven far from the stimulation required to endure the last 16 painful minutes. With Chrissy being the town's sole dealer yet to fall foul of Nebo's atrocious debt management, 
A no-show on his part could have proven detrimental for the lad. A hissy fit-driven night of criminal damage to Bockery was considered. But with this glorious bag of bash to keep him quiet, Bang is safe. For tonight, at least. In true Nebo fashion, he exploits this perfect opportunity to test Chrissy's tickometer. Despite asking for two, his orders bumped up from a half to a full gram. Just enough to keep a buzz flowing until evening, should he stay stingy with the line servings. Unable to suppress his unequivocal relief, Nebo manically pulled Chrissy into a cold, sweaty hug as the cocaine's handed over. Celebrating wildly with the lads as Chrissy trudges off down the town centre leading nettle ridden path. Nev Stiff awaits Chrissy, whose nickname derives from his former profession as an undertaker. A crippling crack cocaine addiction scuppered his promising career, sending the bloke from a three bedroom detached house in Garth to sleeping rough, or hostels on the rare occasion busking rakes in enough for both that and his gear. Nev bangs out Bob Dylan, the hurricane, on his long-term acoustic guitar while slumped in the old doorway of a derelict, boarded-up Help the Aged charity shop. Determined not to break flow, he gives Chrissy nothing more than a fleeting nod as the half-gram wrap of cocaine is placed in his busking pouch. Chrissy takes out a pre-placed £10 note, with the remaining 20 quid pre-agreed to be on tick, to be paid by Nev immediately after Universal Credit comes in at midnight. Chrissy leaps over a cheap wooden garden fence, partially bending it in the process and stumbles into Don's scabby, drought-induced patchy garden. After narrowly avoiding a flattener in the mud, he pops his head through the back door, where his mother, Sigrid's folding up towels with an Andy Weatherall acid house mix blaring. Startled by his abrupt entrance, she jolts up as he mischievously sneaks up from behind. There's a bloody front door for a reason, Sigrid bitterly asserts. Don't let anyone open it past four, though, does he? Sigrid huffs and turns back to folding towels. On the big screens, then, you were? Chrissy convincingly feigns an open-mouthed expression of ignorance. Where was that? Sigrid piercingly glares at her troublesome son. Out front of the food bank, no less. Chrissy subtly smirks and laps up his minor pleasure in Sigrid's heightened embarrassment. Never think, do you, how it looks for me? Can't even feed my own son. Sigrid takes a deep breath. Fucking food bank. Being the gossip of Rachib sparked her irrationally heightened sensitivity to the opinions of others. Way back in the days when Chrissy's punk rock father had a knack for buying copious amounts of speed, instead of providing the basics for Sigrid and her then toddler age Chrissy. All the parental competency murmurs only intensified when he rode off on his Harley Davidson into the sunset, abandoning the family when Chrissy was six. One time thing, Chrissy insists. Bit of discretion next time, okay? Chrissy resists the brief compulsion to swear at his dear mother. Sid in there? Yeah. Sigrid aggressively folds up a towel. And you're having some of that duck stir fries whipping up? Sid's gloomy face lights up in an instant as his beloved half-brother, and for better or worse, role model, struts in for the first time in six long months. Don and Gav hardly notice, with both inseparably glued to Channel 4's six o'clock news. Chrissy sticks his finger on his mouth presents a hefty pre-rolled half-gram joint and hands it to a discreetly euphoric Sid. What a lightener for his dreary day. A little extra for the weekend to go alongside chugging Frosty Jacks and Ashley Fields. Something that will enhance Sid's status within his emo punk group of friends to no end. A heartfelt news report plays from a care home where a 90-year-old woman embraces relatives through a plastic COVID-enforced screen after 18 long months without visits. Chrissy scoffs at Don and Gav's pathetic fascination. You every time you jar that, Chrissy says to Don. Don swivels back his head and grins. Look who it is. Inclination for the ancient. Chrissy suspiciously scowls, unable to scope whether Don's clocked onto the true motive of his fortuitously televised encounter. Don sniggers, shakes his head and fixates back on the news. Gav holds his snidey gaze at Chrissy. He pulls a deliberately hideous face back before turning to Sid. Any upcoming gigs then or what? Chrissy energetically probes. Sid's band are fast becoming local heavy metal legends, despite their tender age. He fronts the group on vocals and guitar, while being able to fill in anywhere other than on keyboard. Sid slumps his shoulders and frowns. Nah, cops are well onto the club now. Clocked our youth. Ah, bastards. We were getting a few pints. The odd cigar, couple of shots here and there in exchange for our electrifying performances. So, 
Now we're thinking of moving them outside. Chrissy vigorously nods. Three day metal fest. Top of the Nordwick Mountain. Camping. Birds. Sid grins. Cops can't stop that. Fuck licences. Age. Ethics. The lot of it. Brahma, I say. We're doing it. Tell all the decent bands you know. Sigrid bursts in with a pile of towels and a vicious scowl slapped on her face. Nothing ban related for this one. She hastily drops the towels on the ironing board. <sighs> Gotta let him do what he loves. Chrissy interjects. Sigrid mockingly scoffs, heads over to the stir fry and size. She turns down the heat, a pedantically minuscule amount, that will have no effect on the cooking and brashly stirs the mixture. If only for the minor matter of being expelled. Chrissy looks at Sid and dashfully tries to hold in a brewing, hysterical laughing fit, successfully limiting it to a chuckle. Sid smirks and looks away. Second school this year. Second braid have tarnished my name within both. Didn't fucking do anything, Sid insists. Don glares at Sid, grits his teeth and turns away. No doubt already plotting imminent passive punishment. Get a slap the next time you use that word with me again. Well, I didn't. They wanted me out from day one. Winding me up and that. Detentions for the same shit everyone else does. After being expelled from a skull friars, within all of two terms for being caught with a 20 bag of weed, Sid took on the role of class clown at a skull Trevan to fit in as the new kid on the block. Consequently, he was routinely egged on to act out during lessons, eventually leading to teachers singling him out and routinely banishing him from class, whether justified or not. On this definitive, rowdy occasion, sneaking in and ripping the wires off every one of the computer room's mice was how he took the anger out, unsurprisingly leading to a swift, permanent exclusion. Sigrid sarcastically smirks at Chrissy. Some of us to thank for that more than others. He's all right. Proper little front man. And he's even got chef in now, haven't you? Sid proudly grins. Nobody in his neglectful, loveless life has ever hyped him up quite like his painfully absent brother. What's all that? Chrissy points at the dish's more mysterious vegetables. Fiddlehead, black radish, Sid boldly declares. See? Look at this one. I ain't even heard of them. Natural talent is this lad. School have just done his head in. Don't think you're having any, Don bellows without taking his eyes off a cringy safe style window TV advert. What? Work's been erratic. We don't have enough. And until one of you two sorts an income of your own, I decide that. Chrissy holds up his hands and winces. Look, I'll come back another day. Oh, uh, Chrissy, stay for a bit. Don't worry about it. Chrissy loudly responds, unable to stifle the visible triggering of his abandonment trauma. I'll bring a family fucking feast with me next time for this tragically impoverished family here. Chrissy fist bumps Sid. The cigarette reaches him for a hug that Chrissy wriggles out of. I'll let you know when a date is set, Chrissy tells Sid. Nothing's stopping us, Sid passionately claims. Pro club soon? Fucking right. And I'm not going CDM again. Chrissy rolls his eyes. We'll give you a two-game trial up front. Better not blow it. Sid pounds his fist as Chrissy waltzes out. A regimented four-hour after-school training schedule has paid off. Graph that's elevated him from a sparingly used reserve only two months ago to a regular starter in Chrissy's top-level FIFA Pro Club team's midfield. A golden opportunity to prove himself within the game's higher echelons. At centre-forward, no less. Don't let Squiddy forget about those 50 Gs! Sigrid calls out to Chrissy, who leaves without answering. Don stumbles to his feet, slumps over to the stove and brushes Sid away. Don, it's done! Sid vehemently insists. I'm serving. Wise enough as to not dare challenge his insecure, flat-track bully of a stepdad. Sid sighs and awaits his fate at the dinner table, sinking his elbows into the ugly plastic tablecloth. As predicted... This arrives in the form of a significantly stingier serving than Don, Gav and Sigrid's. Don shoves the puny plates worth Sid's way as Sigrid glances over, urging herself to act. But in fear of breaching Don's law and order, she takes a seat and cracks out an eerie, false smile. Gav and Don get stuck into their meals, wolfing them down with their mouths repugnantly open while glued to the telly. As the infuriatingly insignificant local news stories rattle off, one after the other, Sigrid's temper boils, reaching spewing point at a piece on immigrants drowning while crossing the English Channel in a dinghy. 57 dead migrants on the Channel. All a climate change distraction. Fucking revolts me. 
Sigrid forcefully retorts with what energy remains after a day of scrolling through and resharing quotes from left-wing Facebook groups. In particular, those purporting that right-wing news channels push false immigration issues to gaslight the public into forgetting about the climate's imminent collapse. None of them are going to get a job though, no? Don suggests, chewing a piece of fatty duck with his mouth wide open. And you know that how? News are on about it flat out. How can you not know? Don takes a hefty swig from a pint can of Stella. Sigrid stares into space, gawping in pure disbelief. She scoffs and turns back to her food. Crucial for the lads to hear it. I pay tax, a hell of a lot of that. Gav will be soon as well, Don righteously adds. What's the point going through school just to learn enough to pay taxes so 57 fucking scroungers can come here and survive off it? Fate's a whirlwind of a thing, you know. All I'll say on the matter. Sid takes his plate and heads gloomily upstairs. Nobody bats so much as an eyelid as Don rants on, rapidly deciding that's far from all he has to say on the matter. Chapter 2 Pound a Pint Chrissy strolls down his gritty, litter and glass ridden town centre side street. Static X blaring from his house, heard as far as nine doors away, lights up his mood. He ups the pace, reluctant to miss another second of partying after the fleeting, yet deflating family visit. An Asda delivery lorry hurtles past, which only means one thing. His housemate Sam Sullivan's had his weekly shopping. True to Chrissy's estimation, Sam stood outside smoking with eight chunky bags for life worth of groceries surrounding his ankles. Unassumingly dressed in one of his sole two outfits, carrot chinos and a plain grey t-shirt, Sam's a game design student at Bangor University. Through a lack of forward planning, namely failing to sort his second year's university accommodation until the last minute, he has rented a room at Chrissy's crusty madhouse, where the parties rarely stop. It's been two months since moving into the bottom floor graveyard room, historically the place is most avoided by tenants. Chrissy's relentless conveyor belt of unsavoury drug customers being to blame for that. In this short period, Sam's developed an all-consuming weed habit, only intensifying his desire to hermit in his room. A sheltered childhood before his exposure to Bangor in the quiet village of Marsden, West Yorkshire, gifted him no exposure to drugs. Chrissy, the instigator and profiteer of Sam's newfound addiction, waves out his arms. Sam grunts, gutted to have misjudged what he thought was the perfect moment to finally enjoy a peaceful fag outside. Sam Sullivan, Chrissy shouts. All right, man. Sam lethargically lifts his head in acknowledgement. Chrissy jogs over. How's the Hiral experience treating you? Yeah, pretty wild, isn't it? I make it wild, me. Can't say I've had much sleep yet. Got lectures first thing in the morning. Chrissy chillingly stares Sam down. One thing he knew was the moment they're out of touch. Barcelona-based landlord let this stray muggle into their sesh pit. Such concerns would eventually be registered. Threatening the order of coordinated madness he swears by. I'll help you with those bags, mate. Chrissy picks up a few bags. Sam instinctively bats Chrissy's arm away. It's all right. Chrissy drops the bags and sticks out his hands. It's no bother. I didn't need the exercise. Sam stutters in a pathetic attempt to backtrack on his outburst. Chrissy sarcastically tiptoes over the bags. Understood. Squeezes past Sam and walks backwards up the stairs. If you need a bit of herbage to sprinkle on your crab pate on toast. He points upwards. You know where I fucking am. Chrissy bobs his head and points to the beat of blaring industrial heavy metal. Raring for an eleventh consecutive day of seshing. He bashes his way through his best mate Squiddy's stiff bedroom door. Even for Squiddy's standards, the room is a tip hole. Its sticky floors littered with clattered beer cans, spilt ashtrays and cocaine covered Xbox 360 cases. Static X, I'm with stupid, thunders out of the crisp Bose S1 speaker acquired in Sam's name by Chrissy with £600 of Klarna credit. Squiddy, whose real name is Gwydion Nash, Hectically headbangs his spiky mohawk while the thick gold chain around his neck flaps around, clanging onto his topless chest. Squiddy's as loopy as they come, 
a dangerous man in his own right, but unless provoked, he's only violent to himself and serves as a chronic source of comic relief owing to his stuntman attitude and insatiable booze and drug intake. It's been 10 years since he and Chrissy moved into this grubby dwelling, with both having been similarly ousted from their family homes aged 16. During the time since, both have made a cushy living from selling cocaine, weed, ketamine and Valium. Their house's reputation among the plethora of local addicts, young and old, as a walk-in sesh pit and gear emporium ensures a constant flow of customers through word of mouth. Those without anywhere to party, that live with strict parents or are homeless, have long craved a piece of the place's merciless sesh life, despite its reputation as a filthy, mouldy shithole. That is until recently, when a heroin overdose on their living room floor in front of 15 regulars permanently scared most away. Only the gnarliest kept coming back such as their collectively acquired walk-in clientele, that for three years before the overdose, they never once had to resort to leaving the house to deal. Stood alongside Squiddy is Mikey, who's chugging Carlsberg out of a two-litre stein glass while pounding his lanky arm upwards, spilling beer down his bashed-up blue Burkhouse mountaineering jacket on the unsightly, stain-ridden brown carpet. Mikey's the group's old head at 30, and likes to think he nurtured Chrissy and Squiddy as drinkers from the age of 13, way back when they first met at the legendary, late noughties, goth-predominant Uni Gardens drinking sessions. After being thrown out of multiple council flats for noise complaints, and with only sporadic freelance graphic design work as an income, Mikey's last six months have been restricted to crashing on the house's grubby living room floor, a perfect breeding ground to further develop his chronic alcoholism. Following the screaming lyrics, He's a loser, she said. Squiddy headbutts the open door of an oak wardrobe and doubles down with a chopping karate kick. Only now noticing Chrissy headbanging in the corner, Mikey wags his arm up while chugging beer. Squiddy glares emphatically at the wardrobe, headbanging with fierce gritted teeth. Chrissy perches his arse down at the desk and gets straight to work. A busy night lies in store down at the Skerry's Pounder Pint. This time he won't be underprepared for the demand, so 30 0.55 gram sized bags of cocaine are swiftly whipped up, all of which will be sold as grams for 80 quid. Sam painfully struggles and optimistically lugging all eight shopping bags at once, a few steps to his bedroom. A shoulder barge wedges open the door. He tries to shimmy through, but an ill-fitting fridge freezer in the corner obstructs the door's wingspan, leaving him wedged with the shopping bags in between the door. Music upstairs doubles in volume as the three stomp their feet, rattling Sam's roof. He sighs and shoves the bags painstakingly one by one through the gap, before clambering over the fridge freezer and into his shoddy, patchily painted student room. A decorative decision by the rogue landlord in part down to obstructing the emergence of thick black mould gathering in the walls, giving him an extra few months until it pokes through and he faces inevitable complaints. A majority of Chrissy's customers resort to slapping Sam's window, should the front door not be answered, in an instant. So not only has Sam drawn the short straw with his room, but he's become the landlord's little bitch and all. Being Barcelona-based... When any issues arise with the house, any inspectors or builders need letting in, the responsibility falls on Sam. This was a contributing factor as to why Sam was picked as the tenant. The landlord scoped him right out for the polite, people-pleasing hermit that he is. Such is the landlord's ignorance of the place's shenanigans. Mikey's pitiful, illegal existence on the living room floor has yet to be questioned. Sam shoves the fridge freezer back the centimetres of wriggle room he has to work with before brushing a mound of tobacco and biscuit crumbs off the desk, salvaging what he can of the cutter's choice as a dusty little reserve for that evening's ominous tobacco shortage. Such is Sam's anxiety around utilising the kitchen's greasy communal oven and surfaces, he keeps a mini hob in his room and makes everything in there. This does, however come at the expense of comfort owing to the entire content of a kitchen being dotted around his compact box room. Out comes the dual hob oven, a new 30 quid purchase off a Joskin on Facebook Marketplace after the last died on him yesterday. 
The problem is, this one's a lump, far chunkier than the previous, and as he places it on the desk, it dangles perilously off the side. But with his 60-inch TV taking the only surplus surface space, he slaps the socket into a dangerously outstretched, trip-hazard-worthy, four-cord plug extension that dangles across the room. Today's cuisine of choice is a roast, an ambitious venture given the microwave-sized oven that will be limited to frozen potatoes, boiled cabbage and cold, sliced chicken tikka. Sam tips bottled water into a saucepan, a result of being warned from all angles of his paranoid family that tap water in cities poisons you over time. An assumption that leads Sam to squander stupid money on stumpy 5 litre bottles of mineral water that he uses for everything bar showering. Mikey stumbles down the stairs clutching his bone dry stein glass, a problem given his guzzling of anywhere between 8 and 20 daily cans of Carlsberg, depending on finances. One of his only self-imposed boundaries is that he keeps cans downstairs and out of sight while getting wrecked upstairs. Lethargy and the consequent laziness stemming from his rice and beer diet ensures his rapid drinking pace is somewhat curtailed, out of hatred for climbing stairs. Although possessing a defective sense of smell, the cabbage steam brothing out of Sam's open room door hits a nerve. Instead of opening his bedroom window, Sam lets it flow into the corridor, not out of spite for his housemates but as a result of relentless bombardment courtesy of a group of local young roadmen, their preferred form of urban terrorism being timing their appearance for Sam's routine 6pm dinner time to lob sticky KFC wrappers and the odd dead seagull through the window. Mikey gags, cups his mouth and legs it into the open plan kitchen and living room that serves as his makeshift bedroom. This humble abode of his bears nothing more than a sheetless single mattress, a ripped up duvet, and a floor caked with beer cans, takeaway wrappers, and a scribbled over, grotty old leg cast. He swats rubble off the mattress, perches himself down, and logs on to his custom gaming PC. Considering it's without question the most cherished of his belongings, the monitor's treacherously balanced on an upside-down green as the shopping basket, with the hard drive wired up through a gap in the plastic. First on the job list is a quick peek on Fiverr, the online platform where he offers graphic design services to withdraw a tenner for an after-party crate. Only that won't be possible. He yelps at an email outlining the terms of a two-week site-wide ban, freezing his Fiverr wallet as a result. Urging a picky client who sent a fifth-order revision request to leap off Menai Bridge is given as the reason, an event that had passed him by until now. A club bouncer's spinning back fist punch and the subsequent concussion on Squiddy's gnarly 26th birthday pub crawl saw to that. Now in an almighty huff, he gets up, cracks open two cans of Carlsberg and pours them simultaneously into his stein, only partly filling it. Mikey chugs the frothy lager, but with Sam's cabbage stench marring his pleasure of the bitter taste, he storms out into the corridor and slams Sam's door shut. Despite feeling sick, he decides a touch of the old stomach linings in order before pound a pint. Shoved in the dry oil and dirt laced fridge, around a plethora of decaying chunks of meat, lies a cling film covered plate of borderline expired beef and rice. Mikey lifts open the cling film, but before he can bend down for a probing whiff, the rabid aroma puts him right off. Not even his barbarian instincts prove enough to go near the dozzy drivel. An opened packet of pilau rice is the compromise, one covered on the outside in dried tomato pasta sauce. With the microwave bearing a gaping hole through the bottom, and now consigned to a mere boxing round timer, he'll have to fry it. In his way lies a monumental mouldy dish mountain, smothering the house's sole communal frying pan. Undeterred by the challenge, Mikey bends over and delicately picks it out by its handle sending the Tetris-style construction of dishes clattering to the floor. Later that sweaty, humid late summer evening, Chrissy, Squiddy and Mikey bombard down the full moon-lit filthy pavement towards Scurries. Chrissy leads the way, as is customary. Squiddy and Mikey slurp from 660 milliliter bottles of Heineken as Chrissy bangs on about Vinny a delinquent Bangor University business studies student who swerved on paying his £250 cocaine tick 
Inbred Sussex cunts getting a slap if I see him, man. Do you know how many punters I've sent your way? Make you a shit ton of dough, me. Mikey chuckles mid-swig, managing to keep the wasteful splutter of beer on the pavement to a minimum. Fuck does he think he is? Come in here, ticking our gear, Squiddy mutters. Robin Banga Uni slots off locals. He ferociously chugs half his beer. Brick won't answer his phone or nothing. Even did a cheeky 1471 text. <laughs> Telling the rat his sister had fucking croaked, man. Cat OD. Squiddy's face tightens. Still didn't answer. Chrissy shakes his head and snatches Mikey's beer for a swig. Fuck! Squiddy lobs his empty beer bottle at a wall. Just for that, I'll twat him on for you. He yanks a bottle of stumpy brassier beer from his pocket and smashes the tip on the wall. It cracks, but remains safe to drink held at a distance from his mouth. We see him tonight. He chugs the beer, mostly missing his mouth and soaking his scraggly four-day stubble. Nah, nah, it's sweet. Squiddy wags his finger while pouring the last of the lager down his throat. It's sweet. Because now I just bag him up that MXE shite and he's all over it, mate. Chrissy buoyantly brags. Decent. Squiddy approvingly nods, with his faith in drug dealing justice somewhat restored for now. Pah! Some dark noise that MXE is. Mikey apprehensively recalls. Chrissy unapologetically shrugs. Didn't pay his tick, did he? Lucky to get fuck all. <sighs> Had a rough time at that, mate. Barber patches all over the roof they wear. Hostel won't ever let me back. Neither holds a glimmer of interest in Mikey's moping as Chrissy loudly whistles at Selwyn Dudley, or Dudders as he's known to most. The scary's bouncer stood guarding the door in the distance. How was that chunk back on the door already? Chrissy gleefully says. Dudders, lad! Squiddy shouts. Chrissy and Squiddy dash over to Dudders, and while running, Squiddy chucks his empty bottle towards a bin badly missing as it shatters. Hi, how are you, dinglers? Dudders pants as Chrissy and Squiddy squeeze him in a tight hug. Both gorp in awe at Dudders' fresh, thick head scar visible on his buzz-cut hair, five stitches above his left eye and brand spanking new glass right eye. All are injuries grievously obtained after courageously banishing Banger's most feared drug dealer, Gustav, from the beer garden one dreary Sunday night last month. To defend his local honour and dignity, Gustav returned at close time with the main goons to gouge out his eye, before battering Dudders into a brief coma. Fucking spot on, Dudders. Nothing but respect, Chrissy eventually says after slapping out of his lucid fascination. Squiddy jabs Dudders in the belly, rattling his sore, fractured rib. Taking it in good heart, he jokingly grabs Squiddy's neck. How's the fresh Google? Chrissy asks, pointing at his right eye. Sound, mate. Clunk teeth out of all bastard, five of them. Nobby I Fat fucking walrus. Dudders points in the local hospital's direction with Squiddy's neck firmly gripped with his other arm. Still lying up the road in a cumalard. Through sheer determination and meticulous planning, Dudders has since found each and every one of the group alone and dished them a taste of their own medicine, none of whom have dared come anywhere near Scuddy's or Dudders since. <laughs> Off your box, you. Chrissy insists. Says the fucking one. Dudders lets go of a now snarling, red-faced Squiddy, who aims a few open palm slaps at his head before storming inside. Chrissy and Mikey chant as they dance their way into the pub. Worth the Google just for that? Dudders beams with pride. Inside, it's roaring. A night that's so far proven by far the year's busiest as a four-piece funk rock band tear it up on the compact makeshift stage, all cramped into a tight space with a red cloth pool table because of Mal, a passive-aggressive bar manager, opting against wasting precious energy hoarding it into the storeroom, owing to his recently commenced Huel Diet-inspired stroppiness. Fifty revellers are crammed in, avidly absorbing the action. Ten at the front skank wildly, headbanging in close proximity to the band having lost all spatial awareness after their second 330mg techno gym pill. Chrissy and Mikey struggle to push their way through the crowd that awkwardly blocks the smoking area's entrance. Squiddy has no such issues, as he briskly storms through to the front with minimal resistance, knocking a few vodka and cokes from people's grasp in the process. 
He screams in the band's frontman MCAT's face and explodes in a fierce fit of disorganised headbanging, single-handedly injecting a surge of chaotic vigour into the crowd. Once Mikey and Chrissy finally squeeze their way out back, they're met by just the bustling atmosphere Chrissy had dreamed of. Few, if any, are on the gear yet, ensuring he's just in time to swipe their hard-earned cash. Chrissy always arrives a few hours into the night, an optimal time when everyone's around three pints down, just pissed enough for the I'm not getting a bag of beak tonight, I swear down, pre-sash insistence to whistle away. Six conjoined wooden benches are rammed with a mashup of punk rockers, skaters and some of the local North Face wearing hardmen. Two skaters take turns ollieing onto a ledge close to a hype concentration of drinkers, nearly raking down a different person's Achilles at each attempt. Before getting the chance to gather their bearings, Chrissy and Mikey are swamped by Gittor Ap Sean, an innocuous, wannabe drug dealer dressed in colourful skate-themed clothing as bright as his blonde, curly hair. Gittor's bull-headed mate Warren follows restlessly behind, indignantly begrudging of those getting wrecked around him while his bank balance languishes on 65p. The legend himself, Gittor warmly says. Chrissy rolls his eyes and feigns a glancing smile focusing primarily on finding the optimal table to ensure he's in view of customers. Gittor and Warren closely follow. Good to see you here, mate, Gittor hesitantly adds. Who even are you? Chrissy asks. Gittor's lower lip drops. After bragging to his cronies for weeks on end about how Ah, my new mate Chrissy will get us flying and graft, Warren's bound to spill the truth, opening Gittor up to fierce ridicule. Gave you that grand joint and peep. Chrissy gazes earnestly at Mikey, who shrugs. When Phil Mitchell was there, Gittor swiftly adds. Chrissy scowls. <laughs> Must have been some shocking gange. Chrissy heads for a newly emptied table in prime attention-seeking position. When can I get a Henry to, lad? Warren abruptly asks. 30 quid's worth on tick is a steep ask for someone you've never spoken to. Especially for a grubby little oik like Warren. On a table in the distance. Chrissy's heavily made up ex-girlfriend Trin grimaces at his mere presence. A brief six-month teenage fling ended once he spiked Trin's drink in revenge for her flat-out sexual abstinence during her period. Chrissy's sturdy, scam merchant, wholesale drug dealer Ben prepares a joint next to her, with all paraphernalia brazenly on show. Ben and Trin met on Tinder, and are out publicly together for the first time. And what do you baitheads plan on doing? If that lack of subtlety gets me sent right fucking down one day, eh? No other cunt will ever shot to you. Chrissy holds out his hands. A perfect little bit of insight into why. Gitter and Warren sink their heads down in shame. Two underage lads sat opposite Trin and Ben spot Chrissy. They hesitate, gaze anxiously at one another before slapping on their blue flat caps and tentatively join Banger's number one small bag cocaine and ketamine dealer's orderly queue. Ben smirks and victoriously leans back, wallowing in the night's solid start to proceedings. Kissy Bray, biggest worm of this land. Trin bitterly remarks. Brahma lad him. Sexual deviant creep like that, a fucking Brahma lad. Ben shrugs while tucking his joint, and Trin turns away in a strop. Chrissy tends for a heavy hand with the ladies. While he somewhat curtailed this as of late, it's a propensity that in his late teens left him on the brink of a six-month juvenile custodial sentence. Only glowing references from his mother, who at the time was a teaching assistant, got him off the hook. Shouldn't be walking the earth, Trin mutters. People change, though. Can't hold what he did in school against him forever, no? Chrissy creepily gazes over before blowing Trin a kiss. That's it. She stands up and subtly draws a small blade from her pocket. Hidden by her coat, it's just visible enough for him to catch the glint of a bright lamp beaming off the metal. If you know what's good for you. Ben looks up in awe. Nothing on Trin's Tinder profile suggested future enforcer material in the slightest. Now he knows he's scored a keeper here. Both an outrageous shag and cheap, capable labour in one. He giggles, delighted with this promising new development in the night's entertainment. Chrissy looks away. He'll think twice about doing that again. 
showing weakness in front of Ben surely added a few bob onto future ounce prices. At the bar, Squiddy giddily hoists up a tray of five stein-sized beers with every facet of his brute strength. As he reaches the crowd's rear, the band's stocky, long-haired bassist Estelle peers over, desperate for a lager after 35 dry minutes. But he'll have to do with the 15th pipe hit of the band's 10-minute break for now, with Warren stood firmly in Squiddy's way. I'll trample ya, Squiddy warns. Warren glances back, scoffs and stands his ground before Squiddy stomps on his foot and bullishly grunts. Gittel's heard that unquestionable final warning before, and he warily drags Warren out of harm's way. Others in front take note and unanimously clear Squiddy's path ahead to the band. Everyone give it up for the barbaric Squiddy Nash, MCAT bellows over the mic. Squiddy plonks down the tray of beer, and the band members gleefully grab a stein each, slurping down some essential Carlsberg jet fuel to get through the gig. He shits all over the lot of you. Any of you young lads thought you were all that proper rocker? Well, you were fucking way off. The benchmark stands among us. MCAT points to a small group of colourful punk women. Some of you ladies. You're getting there. He gives the band a silent one, two, three signal. Not a million miles off. MCAT erupts as the band embarks on their heaviest song. Squiddy leaps forward, tears a curtain off the wall and lobs it into the feisty emerging mosh pit. Squiddy gets stuck in, shoulder barging a couple of teenage, out of their depth posers, flat on their asses. Skerries is David Merrin's first stop after an exhausting escape on foot from Janvar Vechan's Bryn Eneav Psychiatric Hospital, where he's been sectioned for the last six months. A wild night's in order before his inevitable capture and return by tomorrow noon at latest. His gangly six foot six frame ensures he's always caught. Moved by the roar of inside's music, David manically bobs up and down in the middle of a received seven-man cocaine and ketamine queue. Rock and roll, there, boy, he slurs. Get up and warm and cup their mouths, aching to laugh. David breaks out a drum and bass version of Peter Crouch's robot dance on the spot, building up the intensity before stopping to bend down and speak in Chrissy's ear. These definitely bang on crumbs now, yeah? Chrissy sighs and dangles a bag of ketamine behind his back rudely skipping Warren and Gitto out of the queue. David hands over £30, stuffs his key into the bag and shovels a hefty chunk sideways up his ooter. Before getting to snort it, he's overcome by an impromptu sneezing fit, with the consequent gust wafting the precious first taste off the key and onto the floor. Warren and Gitto can't help but howl at his expense. Undeterred after a life as the ridiculed outcast, David wobbles over to three dancing lads stood by the place's trademark 40-foot-high flagpole. In true primary school disco style, he jumps up with raised hands, which takes the dancing lads out of their smooth stride. Spotting Sam in the corner, David's attention flickers to an empty wooden bench next to where he's gloomily sipping a cider in black, all on his little lonesome having been stood up by his plastic university mates. David flips the bench over and with seconds to avoid a painful crush, Sam halts its fall, struggles to uphold the weight and drops it, flicking his feet away from fractures galore as it crashes to the ground. Grasping the severity of his reckless actions, David sprints away, chased off by the bar's snarling landlady. Sam clenches his fists, roars, chugs his full pint and bolts off with his rucksack out of the back gate. A few hours later, with the beak and ketamine flying around. It's time for every Skerry's regular's highlight of the night. On every pound a pint, at least one brave warrior takes a stab at the legendary North Wales Challenge, holding their grip on top of the place's 40-foot-high flagpole as it's vigorously shaken. Some say Clive Allen's 9 minutes 40 seconds at the summit is unassailable, but not Mikey, who's stepping up to the plate tonight with that record firmly in his sight. Stood at the bottom with closed eyes, he takes in deep breaths as the crowd awaits intense silence. One last stretch of his shoulders, and he doggedly jumps onto the pole, shimmying up to the top within 20 seconds. After poking one hand out to signal he's ready, Squiddy starts his waterproof wristwatch's stopwatch timer and violently shakes the pole. For the crowd's entertainment, Mikey momentarily dangles off, 
pretending he's scared. But a minor slip snaps the drift out of any theatrics, and he quickly clutches the pole for dear life. John bolts and Zach Crack square over. Both hench, six foot plus, mean, rough looking brutes sporting full black and white Adidas tracksuits. They barge through the crowd and endeavour to wrestle Squiddy away from the pole. I'll give him a fucking challenge, lad. John insists. Squiddy single handedly blocks their path to the pole. Swear down! Let us through or I'll fucking bottle you. Zack viciously warns. Squiddy's eyes fire up. He whistles Chrissy over and points to the pole. Relishing the challenge, Chrissy waltzes over and shudders the gangly thing. Squiddy glares into the pit of Zack's soul and hands him a glass bottle. Zack grins and reaches for the bottle of Foster's, but at the last second, Squiddy swipes it from his grasp and throws a thunderous knee into Zack's balls, sending him crashing to his knees and on the verge of spewing. As John steps forward for a spot of revenge, Squiddy bottles himself to a collective gasp from the crowd. Blood pours down his forehead as he holds the jagged bottle diagonally towards John, slowly edging towards him. Jasmine Price gawps in a fit of awe at Squiddy from a nearby table. Despite being 17 and underage to drink, she's one of Banger drinking scene's stalwarts and has just spent the afternoon in court, accused of booting the wing mirrors off three cars. Never did she imagine quite how this thrilling evening would make up for the day's utter boredom. As John steps backwards away from Squiddy, she dangles out a leg, tripping him into a bush to a raucous collective roar of jeers. John panics and drags Zack away, scraping his fallen mate's knees on the floor before he eventually finds the strength to stand. I bottle my fucking self, Squiddy shouts. As they scuttle off, Squiddy launches the bottle and it shatters above the cowering, self-proclaimed hard men's heads, showering them in fragments of glass. Mikey abseils down the pole as Chrissy continues to shake it. Fifteen foot from the floor, he loses grip and flops onto a wooden bench. Dirty cooking utensils obscure the bottom corner of Sam's telly. E4 IT crowd repeats have played for five hours straight while he's failed to doze off until minutes ago. Not helped in his quest for sleep by progressively dull hunger pains after barely touching his dry dinner that sits on the desk, gathering fruit flies. An unlit joint dangles cherry side up out of an ashtray on the bed. One toss or turn will surely capsize the brimming ash mountain onto his fresh bed sheets. Uncovered by the duvet and in full clothing, Sam lies face up, quietly snoring with an open mouth. Suddenly, his rigid, stuffy excuse of a snooze is brought to an abrupt end by scatty, nonsensical chatter and drunken laughter from outside, a common occurrence during Sam's short stay at the house. Chrissy grunts hysterically for the whole street to hear. Ah, don't say you lost it, he shouts at Mikey. A horrendous thud on the door and sends a tingle through his spine. Squiddy's head pops through the curtains, his torso wedged in the thin window frame that Sam stupidly left open. Let him see an old what dingler, Squiddy says. Sam rubs his face and slams his bedroom door on the way to let them in. Jasmine and Mikey shove Squiddy through the cramped window ledge, leaving him dangling upside down in Sam's room. Piss off, boys! Jasmine slickly evades Squiddy's downward kick aimed for Mikey's head, the momentum of which takes him through the window, and he plonks headfirst onto Sam's bed. Chrissy bursts through the door and lightly slaps Sam on each cheek as he barges past. Cheers, Squire! Mikey, Jasmine, MCAT, Estelle and the band's pink and black-haired guitarist Fryer blitz past Sam, knocking him on his backside. Sam storms back to his bedroom door, only to be met by Squiddy shoving past, holding up Sam's packet of raw king skins. Won't use them all, Squiddy insists. Everyone heads straight through into Mikey's bedroom, where he's busy scrubbing five plates, as many as he's washed in a month to do lines off with everyone eager to unleash their fresh gram bags. All other than Jasmine, that is, who has usual, is on the scav. On this occasion, her main target is Chrissy, who she's worked on all night, 
throwing out all the fake flirtation she can stomach to ensure the free lines flow her way. After only half an hour, she simply can't bear another second of it. She hangs back her head with crossed arms while Chrissy bores her to death with all the week's universal credit frustrations, which given his lucrative drug-dealing income, isn't something he needs and only claims out of pure greed. Estelle snorts a line of Calvin Klein, a mixture of cocaine and ketamine, off the top of Mikey's PC, dabbing his finger in the remains but pushing vital crumbs into the computer's vent. He desperately sighs, ruining his careless waste of gear. Right in my fucking face she was. How can you not get a job in ten years? You're a repulsive delinquent. All this shit. Mate. You're my fucking dole officer, I said to her. And one that repeatedly fails miserably in their bastard job at that. Chrissy narcissistically rages, long unaware of Jasmine's boredom on the subject. Squiddy whips out the party time, four foot, fold up pool table with its ragged, beer stained cloth from the cupboard. Savouring the opportunity of a stable surface, Estelle snorts a long line of ketamine off the table felt, grimaces, and passes Squiddy the £20 note to finish the slug off. Jasmine comes to the conclusion that a gain of a mere few lines to listen to Chrissy's laborious claptrap simply isn't worth the probable brain aneurysm. She gets up, picks up a pull cue, and steadies herself before smashing the cue ball towards Squiddy's head as he snorts the rest of Estelle's line, only missing by a whisker. Squiddy picks up the ball and launches it her way without letting it go as she leaps behind the sofa in fright. Fryer opens the fridge in search for Budweiser, reaching right to the back. Only before he can yank one out, his face turns pale white. He retches, legs it out into the corridor and bashes into Sam's wall, startling the frazzled lad just as he managed to doze back off. <clears throat> Sorry your fridge out, boys. Dying here. Friar utters before projectile vomiting up the wall and slumping to his knees. To only add to Sam's woes, Shane and Huellen are outside, clattering both the front door and his bedroom window. This pair are two notorious banger bust-up loiterers and among Chrissy's most irritating customers. Both lace Chrissy's pocket just enough to avoid a permanent ban from the house. They stand poorly dressed, covered in the battered tracksuits you'd expect on adult chronic public area cider guzzlers. Pricks definitely in, man, Shane adamantly adds. Flying through this window in a minute if he carries on. Huellen screams through the letterbox in his deep Bangalad accent. Chrissy sprints through the corridor, nearly tripping over Friar's sunken, sprawled out body. Oh, wait there now. Huellen bursts in the second the door opens. How are you? Well, if it isn't Lord of the Tick and his mighty apprentice, Chrissy says. Huellen and Shane burst out laughing and high-five each other, revelling in their new nicknames, whether they shower them in glory or not. Tick, Meister and Lord Tick. Not even after Tick. Cash is in my possession and I'm willing to fucking part with it. Huellen forcefully declares. Do you do point fives a green, lad? Shane flatly asks already spangled after blazing through a 30 bag of weed this evening. 20 bag or fuck all, Chrissy swiftly asserts. Oh, come on, mate. Shane begs. Nah, fuck you and your point fives, man. Sam shuts his eyes, hoping to make every second count of this precious pocket of time to return to his anime-themed dream. Things are heating up in the kitchen. Mikey wraps a crusty tea towel around his mouth and nose while taking out the fridge's manky shelves and content. Hoping to show Fryer up as a pussy for his pitiful reaction to their fridge, Squiddy bends himself up and squeezes into the half-size fridge freezer, to the adulation of everyone present. Chrissy slams the door shut and tips the fridge on its side. MCAT anxiously looks on as Chrissy waves Mikey over. They grab a side each hoist the fridge up and shake the thing until Squiddy falls out and thuds to the floor. Squiddy gets straight back up and swings a flying uppercut Mikey's way that he shimmies backwards to avoid, sending him crashing into the pile of dishes. A ferocious bout of kitchen boxing ensues, as is the sesh house's tradition at any sniff of an opportunity. After not making it to bed, 
Squiddy and Mikey lie face down that next morning, asleep on the kitchen floor as the stuffy sun rays beam down on Squiddy's face through the window, only adding to the bitter dehydration that awaits his hazy eventual awakening. Squiddy's topless with Jasmine's t-shirt wrapped around his head, nicked as a rag to stem the bleeding heavily prevalent by their tenth or so round of brutal kitchen boxing. Empty cans, puke, blood and fag dimps litter the place and an open bottle of whiskey lies on its side next to Squiddy, tactically left with a swig worth for morning. Next to Mikey's hand is the oven door, splattered in dried blood after being torn off and utilised during one of last night's rougher rounds of sparring. Chrissy wobbles in wearing nothing but boxers with a mighty skip in his stride. Jasmine sullenly settled for him after gathering the others present below on gear, and that her plan A, Squiddy, couldn't prize himself away from kitchen boxing. Not even to give her one. Luckily for her, Chrissy didn't last long. 110 seconds to be exact. A small price in her eyes for securing the rest of the night's coke and ketamine buzz. Chrissy stumbles over Mikey's outstretched leg and gazes down in astonishment. A damp bag of ketamine on the floor perilously near a spilt beer swipes his attention. He dashes over and urgently yanks it from harm's way, but can't stand its defective, damp sight and throws it down on a dusty nearby surface. Hacked off by this disappointing early afternoon start, he tips a few frozen sausages onto a crusty baking tray. Jasmine bursts in nude from the waist up and frantically searches the room. Oi oi you slag. Chrissy eerily remarks. Seen my top or what? It doesn't take Jasmine long to find it. She storms over and boots Squiddy in the ribs garnering nothing more than a burp as he stays asleep. Cunt, man. Jasmine rips the top off Squiddy's head. Bloodstain the lot. She spits on Squiddy's neck and throws on her Henley's top. But he in a bump will sort you right out. Chrissy giddily shakes the damp bag of ketamine. Not of that shite it won't. Be a drip for parole. Jasmine checks her phone for the time and grimaces. A mere ten minutes is all that's spare a potentially catastrophic mismanagement of time, given her court-imposed anger management sessions, which are mandatory after twice being convicted of grievous bodily harm this year. That I'm going to be fucking late for. Will we be seeing you next time, then? Get in some better Kenny than that, and you just might. Jasmine says before slamming the front door behind her. This brings an end to Sam's three-hour kip. Deeply pale-faced, he jolts up, checks his phone and flicks off his soon upcoming preset 8.30am alarm, concluding there and then that lugging it up to lectures is simply off the cards. With a bruised shoulder from last night, he turns on his stomach and closes his eyes. Only seconds later, heavy knocking and shouting bellows from the front door where yet again it's Llewellyn and Shane. Freshly banished from the bus stops by patrolling PCSO officers, They're back for some Kenny to get right on it down at the halfway house. A meticulously planned all-dayer is in order to celebrate the release of their old mate Franny Harps from HMP Badwin. Open up or I'll fucking swat you, ma'am. Llewellyn shouts through the letterbox. You'd have gotten tick earlier. None of this would be happening. Shane pretentiously points out. As Chrissy passes, Sam yelps, heard clearly through the walls. Chrissy scoffs and opens the door for the bulging eye records. Dingla D and Dingla Dum, man. Chrissy rolls his eyes. Banger bus stops finest are back. Shane proudly declares. Lord of the tick is no more, lad. Two out of fucking two. Llewellyn brazenly waves a tenor Chrissy's way. Chrissy anxiously ushers the drips in and leads them to the kitchen. Unprecedented times for Lord Llewellyn Tick Jones. Gold mine peep entrances are closed, lad. Two mong students, I eh? Coughed up ten bar for two fucking skimpy little gold leaf rollies. Llewellyn snapped out of his entrepreneurial bravado by the grisly sight of a bloodied Mikey and Squiddy sprawled out on the floor. Need some murders in here, man. Don't let me get back on the tick list. Chrissy shrugs and throws the damp bag of ketamine at Shane. A drop of beer flies off it in midair. Shane catches the bag and closely examines its generous quantity for the price. Bus stops won't know what's in him. He and Llewellyn scurry out of the house with blissful anticipation for the wobbly day ahead. 
Sam's measly 25% university attendance ensures his first tutorial of the year is mandatory. To make abundantly sure of his presence, he stays up all night, ploughing through two entire seasons of Big Bang Theory to help. After two stints of lightheadedness while conquering a nasty hill leading up to the university's main arts building, nicknamed Hogwarts for its ancient mystical design, Sam's horrified to find out his tutorials in a room chock-a-block with lecturers typing away. His burnt-out, Oxford graduate, upper-class tutor Slinger swivels around in his chair with a dreary scowl, majestically not sweating buckets while wrapped in a thick, purple scarf in the sticky, humid room. Sam reluctantly takes a seat. Your lack of application, Sam. It's gone on too long. Talk about good on paper but failing to deliver. This AI scripting paper from last year... Oh, I can't wait much longer for it. There's reasons. Slinger scoffs and shakes his head. What did you expect? But I can't sleep to save my life. Sam protests. Yeah, yeah, party's in your house. You're in uni, and if you can't embrace it, fair enough. But you've had all summer to find somewhere decent, and you haven't, have you? Would have when my loan not six weeks late. Take some responsibility. There are hardship loans. Oh, yeah. All of a hundred quid to last me the month. Right. Bad habits will be your downfall. We've practically begged you to get counselling and you quit. How can we help you if you don't help yourself? All that medical professional knew was how to scribble out the prescriptions. He might as well prick me with a bit of skag himself. He's a qualified therapist. Not going near that thug again. Best one this uni's ever had. And you know better than him, do you? About giving adolescents with circumstantial depression, caused by university-induced poverty, a benzo-shaped gateway to shooting junk up Bangor Mountain, just so they can get on with their essays? Yeah, can think of a fair few fucking better ways to help students, me. Get your head straight for this course, whatever it takes. Get a payday loan. Get it off your nan. Sell one of your little old game boys. Sam's heard enough. He gets up and storms out of the door, leaving a cauldron of murmuring lecturers in his wake. Yearning to keep his university hopes alive and avoid the turmoil of moving back in with his mentally abusive parents, Sam storms home and heads for a tentative word with Chrissy in the kitchen. Bloods always made him squeamish, and the dry cocaine nosebleed stains littering the lino creep him out. Session of the year. How are you, lad? Chrissy asks. Yeah, yeah, good Chrissy. Not bad, just wanna... Chrissy cracks open a can of tomato soup, turns around and holds it out, cutting Sam off. Soup? Nah, you're alright, not a fan. Chrissy winces, unable to hide his overwhelming sense of rejection. He empties the can aggressively into an already boiling kettle. Good job I'm peckish. Sorry mate, look, I just wanted to have a word about the noise levels at night. Way out of you. It has been a mental few months, I know. And we were all actually just saying that last night between us. Sam's jaded eyes perk up. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're going to tone it down from now on, I think. With all the application we can muster. That's ever so considerate of you all. It's nearly job done in uni now. You have no time for me. Yeah. Look, that's my number. You just text any time. Squiddy's on one. Whatever. Sam gratefully clutches the damp scrap of paper. I won't abuse this boundary. You have my word. Not only that, it's about time you are the grammar this ammo. Chrissy passes Sam a bag of weed, one of the ten underway gram bags designated for noobs who are oblivious to the fact they're getting mugged off. On the house. For all the ag you claim to have endured. Just keeps me even in these harsh times. You sure I can have that? Never been more sure of anything. And if that shit somehow doesn't tickle your bollocks. Chrissy hands over a strip of Valium and winks. Sam timidly accepts the strip after careful consideration. Kettle steam spouts out into Chrissy's smirking face as Sam backs out of the room, painfully embarrassed to ask how you take Valium and keen to get out of Chrissy's dark energy without knowing why. Chrissy pulls soup into a bowl while staring at Sam. Once Sam's out of eyesight, A dollop drops on Chrissy's toe, and he leaps up in writhing pain. You prick, Chrissy shouts. 
Fearing that one was aimed for him, Sam darts back into his room. Ruining the decision to give out free drugs, Chrissy decides it's time for some passive-aggressive revenge through the boys' new favourite game. Aiming for the slimiest possible, Chrissy examines the backyard's rat-infested mound of bin bags and menacingly drags out the gnarliest three. As Sam rams pizza and chips into his mini oven, Chrissy lobs the bags against his door and dashes up the stairs to watch the drama unfold. A grimy, green fluid stain slithers down the wall, with one of the bags torn from the impact and its grisly, multiple week old content dispersed around the floor. Sam opens the door with his sticky, tomato sauce covered fingers and cups his head in despair, long having thought these days were over, that they only did this as a corny frat boy initiation. This time, the carnage is far worse. Sam scoops up the mess with his bare hands into three overflowing bin bags and drags them to the outside bin. Watching from his bedroom window with a fresh joint ready to light, Chrissy manically jumps up and down, summoning Squiddy and Mikey as Sam takes a breathless break halfway through the few foot journey to the bin. Oh shit, he's out, Chrissy says. Squiddy and Mikey cram themselves onto the window ledge, closely watching Sam's every move as he lifts up the green bin's lid and drops the bags furious that the bins rammed, something the boys had fully well planned. Oh, already tried that one, mate, Squiddy says. Better luck next time, squire. Reluctant to add to the backyard squalor, Sam gazes over to the house opposite and looks down, stroking his chin, just as the boys had hoped. No way! Mikey utters in amazement. He's checking the odds, Chrissy gleefully adds. Sam shakes his head. Holy shit, Mikey remarks. Sam assertively drags the bin bags across the main road at a slug's pace. Two to one, he gets sparked out. Squiddy's eyes light up. Withstanding any fleeting second thoughts, Sam sheepishly opens their neighbour Gustav's bin lid and quietly sticks in the bags. Gustav tears open his red curtains and screams out of the window in Hungarian. Sam legs it back inside clipping his toe on the curb as he stumbles into the open front door. Just the mid-morning kick the boys were after. They jeer Sam on and erupt in squeaky laughter as he clatters into the door. But this is no standard neighbour. Mental old Gustav, a true Eastern European brick shit house, bursts out with a can of Fosters in a vest and striped tracksuits, fresh from polishing off the morning's first half bottle of vodka. Chrissy, Squiddy and Mikey duck down out of sight eager to keep their Googles intact, unlike poor Dudders. Rumour has since revealed this as a trademark of Gustav's, with 20 such victims left in a similar state back home. Gustav's head twitches, and he looks down suspiciously before strutting over the road and ferociously slamming on their front door. Chrissy carefully slides down the window, anxious of the madman copping their ungovernable hysterics. Following a solid ten minutes cowering under his bed, Sam finally finds the courage to get up, but only after hearing Gustav zoom off in his vintage Fiat Strada. An L-shaped spliff build in his hand rips as he jolts up at an unnerving clang from the oven. Lights out. What a con! He's seething to be left with yet another impotent oven only days into its use. Short of money for a takeaway, and with the shooting hunger pains proving unbearable, Sam heads for the kitchen's greasy communal oven, an eventuality he's feared since day one. He shoves in the baking tray and picks up the flawed oven door, dropping it the second last night's blood touches his hand. Mikey gazes over, chuckles from his bedroom, scratches last night's head wound and turns back to the computer, oblivious to the light stream of blood now trickling down his ear. Chapter 3 Dio. Sam's fiery mother, Sharon Sullivan, widely known as Shaz, drives down a dark, bumpy, pothole-ridden country lane carved out through a field towards her traveller cousin's remote Bickerton settlement. It's her first visit in ten years, and buckets of joyous childhood memories flood back from every corner of the land. Thomas Sullivan, her overweight, speckled husband, slumps in the arched back passenger seat, shivering in his skimpy, non-weather-appropriate outfits on this bitter evening, bashfully sulking at Shaz's stonewall insistence on keeping the windows wide open on account of her chain-smoking. 
having tried everything possible to isolate Shaz from the Barrys. He's thoroughly dreading the probable hostile reception from her sturdy cousins, all long suspicious of his intentions. Talk Sport Live commentary rustles from the radio's weak signal, disrupting Thomas's avid analysis of West Ham's Europa League Conference League fixture. Paramount research for a promising weekend fourfold accumulator. Getting back for the Brazil game at 11, no matter what. Thomas insists. You can still bet on it. Shaz sharply says. Not if I'm not watching it. Shaz looks away and takes in a deep, hostile breath. Missing three Europa League games for this already. Two of them are winning. Fucking ages since we've been here. Suck it up for a bit. They ride over a significant pothole and a screech from the bottom of the car stabs through Thomas's fragile, stingy soul. Steep night already. Their jeep's headlights glow up a roaring party in the distance next to a bundle of caravans. Kids roast marshmallows in the billowing flames of an extravagant bonfire stacked with cracked wooden chairs and tables, surrounded by scores of Shaz's family. While on the next field, a full-blooded, 13-a-side football game is in full swing, contested by a mixture of young children and adults, with clothing as goalposts. Shaz bursts out of the car and into the arms of her fearsome lump of a cousin, Connor Barry. So good that you're here, Connor says. Thomas shrivels up and lingers awkwardly as they hug, chronically intimidated by Connor's brute force and alpha male energy, a fact that stood since first meeting the then 14-stone 11-year-old on the first day of secondary school, fresh from a reluctantly leaving his hometown of Bradford. Connor squeezes Thomas's hand. Chief? In turn, aggravating his early-stage carpal tunnel syndrome. Keen to melt into a corner and keep firmly to himself, Thomas leads Shaz to a pair of bright, fireside blue and white deck chairs. Not even the soothing flames can take his mind off the football. He holds a rigid posture, tapping his foot restlessly against the chair. Connor waddles over, cradling an impressive haul of beer bottles shoveled on top of his tree trunk-esque forearms. First, he offers Thomas one, who coldly shakes his head to Connor's visceral bewilderment. Made me drive and all. I'll fucking well have one then. Shaz swipes a beer and cracks it open off the fire's metal barrel base edge. Connor points over to Shaz's 17-year-old cousin, Caleb Skilling Barry, a good-looking, dark-haired lad caked in white designer sportswear, bantering in the distance with his slender, blonde-haired new girlfriend. Ah, man, Skilling. Four different strains of weed over there. Only one of them's not own brew, Connor proudly declares. After teaching Skillin every ounce of hydroponic knowledge he has, Connor handed over control to the family's attic weed factory last month, after 15 long years of service. Net profits have never been healthier since. Not for me as of late. Connor shoves his head into his hands. What? He turns to Shaz. You'll have some, won't you? Shaz glances anxiously over at Thomas, but assured he won't dare give her a lip around family. She settles for ominous silent treatment and heads over to Skillin. Connor breathes a sigh of relief and plonks himself down in her seat. Got everyone into it at school, you? 60p a spliff, bringing them in all pre-rolled. Connor cheerfully recalls. Spores. Thomas peeks around, petrified of anyone hearing. Not a soul at Huddersfield Secondary School strayed far from the efficient Thomas Sullivan for all their green and hash needs. Due to Thomas's parents' slapdash interest in his activities, anywhere between 10 and 50 spliffs were skinned up a day in his room from the age of 11, pre-order level dependent. Thomas fixates on Shaz hugging Skillin in the distance. They chat cheerily as Skillin hands over what looks like a chunky bag of weed, half an ounce at least, Thomas fears. Since quitting his seemingly chronic habit 12 years ago, Thomas has entirely banished Shaz from smoking the stuff. Envious of any potential fun occurring without him. 4.30 you were up before school rolling him, weren't he? Connor probes, snapping Thomas out of his attachment injury-induced days. Thomas looks around without answering, demoralised by the certainty his shoddy reputation within this circle's fallen off a cliff. Connor cackles. Even battered Gazza John over it in year eight. 30p he owed you. Half for one, Skinner. 
Triggered by Thomas's lack of response, Connor stops laughing. Ruthless. We'll give you that. Conveniently for Thomas, his phone rumbles as Sam calls for the first time in months, paving a perfect opportunity to piss off back to the car and check out the Bangor Races afternoon winners. Shaz sits back down with both a spring in her step and a free ounce of weed, itching to devour her year's first smoke. How's that Sam anyway? Connor asks. Shaz sighs. He's doing what he likes, I think. Getting through uni. Not been using his time to pull many birds, though. <laughs> Bless him. That you know of? Eh, Chin's little one over there. Who's Chin? Gav. Gav Chin, everyone calls him now. Anyway, Connor points out towards the football field. Spit of Sam, or what? Shaz feigns a half-smile, masking her empty nest anguish to perfection. Connor whistles in a damaging pitch for the ears nearby. Chin, lad. Chin grabs the arms of his Liverpool shirt-wearing children, John, who's three, and Charlotte, who's five, and proudly struts over. Fourteen he were when he had Charlotte. Fourteen! <laughs> More guinea. Look at him. Connor and Shaz chuckle as Chin heads over with a cheesy smirk. Having never met her young second cousins, Shaz struggles to hold back the tears. Sam paces frantically around his room while on the phone to his father, already frazzled from three hours of Al Jazeera news whirling in the background. His go-to comfort when in ultimate manic, scatterbrain mode. Look, I've got two quid to my name. No other, no nothing. Sam says. Thomas lounges back in the car, smoking in full view of the party. I just can't see how it's late me. Well, it is, Dad! Sam forcefully butts in. Spent it all on that bloody smoke of yours. That funky stuff, no doubt. Thomas's deep-rooted, irrational distrust in his word has only widened the ever-emerging wedge between them. Sam exhales and composes himself. I can get a hardship loan, maybe. But for today, I'm fucking famished. You'll get anything I lend back as soon as. I'll tell you what, give it till Monday, at me and your mum... <coughs> We'll bell the tosses. Sort this right out, lad, we will. Sam rubs his head. Great, but for today and the rest of the weekend, a loan of about 20 quid wouldn't go amiss. Thomas tallies up the litany of weekend hackers planned as he ponders Sam's irritating request. Please! I'd love to, but get right on it, down races tomorrow we are, see? One time I ask for your help. You're not serious, are you? Thomas clenches his jaw amidst the hostile silence between the pair. Unable to hack the eerie tension, he whacks up Talk Sports' volume. Hope that shrimp pie gives you the right runs! Sam pelts his phone into the wall and slumps down by his desk, grimacing at the sight of an empty Rizzler packet. You fucking what? Right creature Bangor's turn you into. Bits of hunger will do you no harm the sounds of it. Thomas's voice muffles before he abruptly hangs up. At breaking point and bone dry of smoking papers, Sam snatches his last two pound coins and key for a dreaded shop trip. Before making it to the front door, he skids on last night's crusting mound of vomit, dropping the key and coins, and left delirious at the strongbow dark fruit heavy vomit stains on his topman canvas shoes. Spotting only one of the coins, he bends down and scans the floor for the other. Chrissy smugly strides out of the kitchen, subtly gazes down, and shimmies his foot, nudging the key out of sight. Steak, bacon or rustlers, is it? Painful choices to either all this time. Sam points at the pound coin in his hand. Chrissy puffs out his cheeks and hands Sam the second coin. Fwaa! Oh, the trauma don't get to your head. Sam chuckles and heads out the front door, cheerfully sticking his thumb up on the way. Oh, I know. Nice one. Chrissy scowls in bitter resentment the second Sam leaves. Taking the chance to up the ante, he concludes that Sam's room will now be all access. Back to the good old days when locks were a sin before proper tenants found their way here. A glorious era, with every room readily available for emergency Rizzler and tobacco taxing. Chrissy picks up the key, locks Sam's door from the outside, and carefully barges it in, tactically avoiding any cosmetic damage. A failed lock test confirms his success, 
and he skips off upstairs, relishing Sam's response in whatever form it comes. Sam's slumped shoulders shiver pitifully on this one degree, drizzly evening. It's nothing but his own fault, having failed to upgrade his thin dark red H&M coat, despite the cold being a routine factor and excuse for his hermit life. Ben thunders past and pulls up on the curb in a tidy white Land Rover pickup. Ten hooded ewes await him, giddily gathered on the pavement, jumping around and pulling wheelies on their stolen bikes. While it's a mere few hundred metre trip to the shop, this motley crew adore heckling Sam, and with Brandon, the main culprit of routine seagull dropping through Sam's window, eyeing him up, Sam knows he's right in for it. With pavement only covering their side of the road, he's left with no choice but facing the dinglers to avoid a night consumed by dismal hunger pangs. Ben wags out his second finger, and Gitto Apshorn, the bumbling leader of this predominantly school-age gang of roadmen, swaggers over, dressed in all black. How are you, my mate? Gitto lights a spliff with a clipper lighter by Ben's car window. Ben slaps the hefty joint out from Gitto's mouth and it rolls under the car's tyre. Gitop fights the pain and keeps a straight face while lightly tapping his slightly bloody lower lip. Told you, didn't I? No chong in on the fucking high street, Ben viciously demands. Gitop nervously nods and hands over ten twenty-pound notes with a trembling hand. Ben cackles cynically, bathing in Gitop's terror and embarrassment until he's had his fill. Only then does he pass over a three and a half gram bag of cocaine. Dingler, man, Ben mutters. Sam strolls tentatively past the group with utmost care while they jeer his way, mocking his now crusty £16 blue top man canvas shoes and mop haircut. Some deliberately stand in Sam's way as he heads past the car and glances briefly at Ben. Tell that little rat what a night. He can come here and chat shit about my point eight to my face. See what fucking happens. Ben warns Gitter. Brandon opts to take things into his own hands, simply unfulfilled with measly verbal taunts. He throws up his hood, darts over to Sam on a BMX, and trudges slowly alongside him. Let's see you backflip then, lad. Brandon insincerely asks. Sam fearfully speeds up. Brandon gazes back at his cronies before doing a 360 degree tailspin, swiping Sam's feet and sending him thundering to the floor as the pound coins roll into a drain. Sam jumps straight up and sprints back to the house with a minor limp. Enraged by the brazen disorder and lack of respect at a time of business, Ben hurtles the car ten metres down the road towards Brandon, running over Gittel's joint in the process. Pull ten bag in there! Gittel grunts under his breath. Ben leaps out and pummels Brandon one on the chops, to the shock of his cronies, who do nothing to help all weary of losing the best coke dealer in Bangor should they step in. Brandon's legs give way, and he rocks his head on a shop window that cracks. Ben aims a kick at Brandon's head as he squirms back on the floor, but stops halfway through. As a tax for his urban sins, Ben lobs Brandon's £650 BMX onto the back of the pickup. Roller's drum and bass blares through the house ensuring Sam's evening will not only be a hungry one, but another disrupted by chaos. Gitter, Warren and Jasmine have tagged along for tonight's excursions. It's Gitter and Warren's debut sesh at the house, an opportunity grasped with both hands after buying a quarter ounce of haze each from Chrissy, and, for the first time, not getting told to fuck straight off afterwards. With their wounds from previous battles well and truly licked, Mikey and Squiddy stand facing each other in the fourth round of the night's highly anticipated kitchen boxing bout, a scrap only built up further by the oven door scandal and a day of fierce trash talking. Mikey's gone all out in preparation, morphing down six white bread ham sandwiches to build up the necessary strength, a monumental effort given his skimpy diet-induced shriveled stomach. Squiddy hoarsely grunts, knackered from the gruelling opening three rounds where he was dished heavy punishment to the ribs. Mikey opens the fourth round by exploiting Squiddy's uncharacteristically lax defence with a torrent of body shots. Squiddy winces, failing miserably in his plight to keep a straight face. 
surprised by Squiddy's lack of response. Mikey wheels his arm around, showboating for the expectant crowd. Warren and Gitot cheer wildly in the background, as both cannot believe their luck. A front row seat at a notorious James Street kitchen scrap. Jasmine swipes Chrissy's litre bottle of Jack Daniels and takes a chug, with her eyes staunchly glued to the fight. Chrissy sighs, but daren't complain and risk jeopardising a swift little round two upstairs with her later on. Stop pissing about then. Mikey needs no second invitation. He pummels Squiddy one on the cheekbone, and Squiddy's eyes squint as a red raw mark starts forming. Despite this, Squiddy's head remains unmoved and he roars, finally having woken himself up. Fucking flatten him, Squiddy. Jasmine cheers. Squiddy winks at Jasmine. Might as well scrap all your Mario saves now. Chrissy shouts over to Warren. Might as well skin up that eighth. Divided into four joints will do. Warren boisterously responds. Gitto high-fives Warren as they turn to each other and chuckle, both supremely confident in their bet with Chrissy over the fight. If Mikey wins, they get an eighth of weed. But if Squiddy were to prevail, then Warren has to hand over his beloved Nintendo DS. Chrissy's phone rattles off. To his dismay, he despises this aspect of the dealer life that often leaves him socially drained, sometimes by as early as 2pm. Squiddy repeatedly pretends to slap Mikey, who shudders each time, much to Squiddy's amusement. Chrissy checks the text. It's one from Sam, saying, Hey man, sorry to be that guy, but can you keep the music down a tad, please? Ten long minutes later, and Sam's at last been gifted a response. A picture of Mikey knocked out on the floor with a cut forehead and purple sharpie scribbled over his face. Warren, Gitter and Squiddy all pose around him, pulling ridiculous punk rock poses with their wagging tongues out. This is swiftly followed by a second picture of Chrissy smoking a gram and a half size spliff with deliberately messy hair. Finally, a voice message follows that's voiced by Gitter in a posh royal accent. Due to the catastrophic trauma and hardship we have all witnessed here, the minimum permitted level of sound in line with Sesh House policy is being closely adhered to. We thank you for your sheer cooperation and understanding on what is a difficult time for all. Basking in the glory of his latest gambling triumph, Chrissy pokes his legs up on the sofa and lies back, playing Mario on Warren's reluctantly forfeited Nintendo DS. His dissociative saviour from countless of his father's violent cocaine rampages. Mikey lies unconscious on the floor, the cannon fodder for Chrissy's minor fortune. Squiddy puffs out his chest and chugs spiced rum, delighted having earned his first knockout win in over a hundred such spars. Jasmine prods the motionless mess with her foot. Not just going to fucking leave him there, no? Chrissy grimaces. Ruining the decision to invite Jasmine and her order-threatening, irritating demands over. Nice tug might do the job. Chrissy waves his arm near Mikey's crotch and waggles his tongue. Get on it then, boy. Won't work off me, will it? We've all had you, and he hasn't. Cunt won't stop banging on about it. Fucking creep. Not a chance. Jasmine gags and shakes up a two-litre bottle of budget cola. Er, uh, that's Mixer, darling. Jasmine pours the cola over Mikey, successfully flicking him back to civilization as he flails his sticky, startled head around. Chrissy snatches the bottle, glares at its nearly empty contents, and wickedly stares her down. Not even enough for a jar. Chrissy grunts, picks up Warren's pint glass of Guinness and tips it over Jasmine. With the last fiver of his fortnightly pocket money blown on a single 0.05 gram line of cocaine, Warren's left unable to replace his last beer. He punches the wall, incensed at his now pathetic beer and drugless plight as the low-grade bash cocaine rapidly wears off, only minutes after the line. Better piss off for more, Chrissy warns Jasmine. With tonight's free ketamine binge in mind, she swiftly obliges, deliberately leaving the front door wide open as to hopefully attract thieves. After being gifted a quarter gram of ketamine by Franny Harps outside the shop, she almost doesn't bother with the cola but revelling in the thought of Chrissy's elaborate, subreddit-led vendetta against the stuff, 
she grabs a bottle of budget Diet Cola. For nothing other than to waste time before presenting the sesh's key component, she takes a pit stop and stumbles into Sam's unlocked room, relishing the thought of Chrissy restlessly awaiting, stifled by his refusal to drink straight spirits. Sam grimaces at the ragged-haired, sticky lass approaching him. Upsets me, it does. Jasmine seductively mutters. Get out! Not even a lousy how are ya? Please get out of my room! Jasmine bites her lip and edges ever closer to Sam. Look, I've had all these lot. Jasmine climbs onto the bed, sending Sam squirming into the corner. But it's you I want. She grabs his crotch from the outside and whispers in his ear. Not too slight. She smirks. Classy. Full of respect. Everything I want fucked into me. None of them have it in them. Pretty fucking far from slight. Sam shoves Jasmine off the bed. All right, mate. She pulls out a chair from the desk and slumps on it backwards. We'll get to know each other first, then. Kinga would go a long way. Got one? I shall swiftly return. Jasmine winks and darts out of the room. Course you don't. No sooner than Jasmine's sticky hands leave the door handle, Sam drags over a five-foot-high clothing cupboard and places it in front of the door, breaking quite the sweat in his excursions. Jasmine police knocks repeatedly and barges into the door with a run-up. Blaring dub techno rambling through the walls drowns out her chorus of foul, rejection-sensitivity-influenced expletives. She punches the door and reluctantly gives up hope. Desperate to drown the night out, Sam makes an executive decision to break his Valium virginity. And without knowing any better, he throws two 30mg pills in his mouth, chugging them down with a pint of water. When nothing happens for a good few minutes, he assumes the entire pack's needed for any effect. But being the ultimate steady eddy, he settles for half as an experiment. Three more sink down his trap and he lies back for a game of FIFA, back to a career mode within inches of taking his beloved Bradford AFC from League 2 to the Premier League. As the Valium quickly sets in, his usual airtight defence suffers and he crashes to a 4-0 half-time deficit before giving up and whacking on robot walls repeats. Throbbing ankle and neck pain magically fades away and he sinks into what is usually a disgustingly bumpy, rock-solid mattress for a deep sleep. Finally, he blissfully thinks, while nodding off as the living room speaker's dirty, stinking bass fades out. A week later, and Chrissy's just back from Mice G, fresh from parting ways with 1,200 quid. What he was promised in exchange was eight ounces of Ben's self-proclaimed dankest lemon pie to ever grace for the Castech. On closer inspection, this couldn't be further from the truth, with its seedy, leaf-heavy content expertly wrapped up in six layers of cling film, hidden until proudly unveiled to Squiddy and Mikey, much to his abject embarrassment. Not only will this hit Chrissy hard in the pocket, but his skewed inner self holds an unhealthy chunk of emphasis on the quality of weed he can offer to mates and the people of Bangor. Such shattering of his reputation in this regard will leave his soul dangerously bare. And he more than knows it. Never in years of dealing for Ben has he been fucked over quite so spectacularly. Squiddy sprawled out on a beanbag, grimacing at the leafy gram and a half tester spliff swiped from Chrissy's memory foam pillow sized bag of weed, without consent. Chrissy frantically paces around his condensation mould ridden, dingy room. Tasty ash your crystals made, Chrissy lad, Squiddy mockingly claims as he stumps out the joint. This only adds to Chrissy's anxiety. His eyes whirl manically at the thought of Mice G's wreckheads howling at his expense. All the loonies in Mice G are getting wrecked, and you're stuck with that, Squiddy adds. Prick. With the added inconvenience of feeding his extortionate weed tolerance, Chrissy's customary five nightly hours of kip are in real peril with this substandard farm weed. Not my fault you're a dingler and you went back to Ben once again. Anyway, Sam, I'll have a bit of that off you. Squiddy apathetically points out. As quick as that, Chrissy snaps out of his early stage nihilistic downward spiral. 60 quid off Sam, 
and a quarter ounce of proper Barnevelt Brothers ganja from their Rachib cottage is well and truly in the bag. Where's that gimp been at? Chrissy shrugs. Week at least since he's got a hold up here. He nonchalantly says before heading downstairs and pounding on Sam's door. North Wales Bud's room service for Sam Sullivan. Now, Chrissy despises being ignored, not least by those deemed weak, and the lack of acknowledgement gets right under his skin. Again, he bashes to no avail. To put his all-accessible house dream to the test, he gazes left and right, carefully checking his anonymity before failing with a run-up barge, bruising his shoulder as a dose of bitter deadbeat karma. Hardened to such bashes from years of rugby, it doesn't halt his dogged perseverance, and after four similarly Herculean bashes, a tight gap's carved open to squeeze in. It soon becomes evident that an eleventh shoulder dislocation of the decade was far from worth chancing. Lying on his side, Sam's motionless, weak old vomit-covered face points straight at Chrissy as he edges in. Troubled more by the possible jail time, Chrissy shrieks at the sight of a half-empty Valium strip stuck to Sam's jeans with dry vomit. Anger seeps through his soul, indignation at how someone could be so pathetic that they croak after five poultry Valiums. So that's how he justifies it, and any flittering sorrow beyond the shock is short-lived. What a weak little man. It's got to be the landlord's fault for letting him in here, so he can deal with it now. Despite sticking pity for Sam aside, he cannot spare himself the same luxury. Time to spread the workload. Putting on his A-game mask of dismay, Chrissy scampers up to Squiddy, who keeps his genuine guilt and despair firmly internal, a trait perfected for childhood survival purposes owing to his physically abusive army sergeant father. With disposable gloves, they ransack the house for incriminating evidence and pack a night bag, understandably leaving the horror of Sam's room until last. Squiddy cracks a quiet tear while tearing the Valium strips stuck on Sam's jeans, and after a harrowing, private last look at the fallen lad, he stuffs their collective evidence bin bag into a hold all. Yeah, just welfare check would be spot on. That's son of mine. Don't want to be trouble or out, Chrissy says on the phone to the police poorly imitating Thomas's Bradford accent before slamming the front door behind him. There's only one place for such desperate times, and that's Squiddy's derelict old house. A place affectionately renamed Base Camp, the grape's pre-drinking age den of drug and drum and bass music exploration. Their long-term sporadic sash pit is a third floor flat in the town centre above Peacocks, somewhat accessible for the dingy, rat-infested back alley. Despite the journey being brisk, Squiddy crams in an open palm slap and rollicking for the brash 999 call. Lit up by minimal, sketchy streetlight, they only just spot the graffiti-littered wall of their now barricaded, weed-stricken second home, a place regularly relied on during North Wales Police's Project Scorpio, a force-wide crackdown on county lines drug dealing they served as primary targets on. Squiddy panics. Never has it been boiled up before. But the anguish soon passes. Nobody keeps him out of anywhere, not least a wooden barricade. To reassume control of what he believes is his, the pair head up Bangor Mountain, where Squiddy's buried four weapons. Concluding that only a crowbar's up to the job, they head for Bangor Golf Club's fifth hole, where it's semi-brazenly stashed in a mountainside bush. Squiddy relishes a reunion with his favourite crowbar, the weapon found in Ashley Fields and first swung at his father, who'd headbutted Squiddy for the second time that day and the last time of his life. A three metre leap separates them from the small roof surface surrounding base camp's last remaining entrance. Still spinning from three Xanax bars munched minutes before Dole earlier in the afternoon, Squiddy stumbles over what is usually a breeze of a jump, clattering his ankle on the plastic gutter. Chrissy painfully underthrows his lob of the crowbar, leaving Squiddy reaching over and clinching onto the roof ledge with the mere grip of his toes risking everything to save his favourite toy from sinking down into the tight, dark, nettle-infested drop below. Chrissy elegantly clears the jump, with room to spare, but on landing, his maroon red Adidas trainers and G-Star number printed jeans sink through the rooftop. Seething from the crowbar near Miss, Squiddy roughly drags Chrissy out of the hole, adding needless additional scraping to his leg. A thick, five-foot, tightly fitted wooden panel blocks them out. 
Hoping to change that, Squiddy wedges the crowbar in between the wall and panel with all his might, while Chrissy plants his feet onto the scabby, pebbled ash wall and heaves on the bar from above. Thirty seconds of brutal excursion later, and they both stumble back, dangerously close to falling off the roof's ledge. On sight of the boys, a rat scurries back into one of the wall's vast array of holes. Distraught, its long-standing free reign of the place could be over. Once a council house occupied by Squiddy's family between the ages of two and five, they were evicted for perpetual loud music and shouting-related noise complaints, leaving this corner of squalor to stand empty ever since. Bare remnants of the dreary lino and hideous wallpaper only look better for a smattering of damp mould and browning. Sparks flitter around a plug as Squiddy tests the ancient, rusty microwave. Chrissy picks up a stray copy of 442 magazine. Squiddy snatches it and jumps up and down on the spot, delighted having left it there a year ago. Not only will this cure his mobile data deficiency boredom, but it serves as a solid indication of the place's lack of squatters since their last visit. Few things keep him up at night, but intrusive thoughts of grubby bagheads rummaging through the setting of his only happy childhood memories is one of them. To only add to Squiddy's ecstasy, their metal barrel fire pit sits intact and unmoved in the middle of the living room. Two boxes of fire lighters and eight planks of wood nicked from a Penrose Gardeneth building site sit stacked as neatly as were left mostly still flammable, despite the minor damp damage. Harnessing technique from their self-proclaimed combat specialities of chopping leg kicks, Chrissy and Squiddy stamp the sheets of wood down to size. Struggling due to his bashed up legs, Chrissy whacks one against the door frame to Squiddy's utter disgust. No doubt tallying the disrespectful transgression on his land, Squiddy flams on the floor and saves the gnarliest violence for their long-awaited next kitchen boxing bout. With the living room partially visible from the high street, they drag the pit out to Squiddy's safer old bedroom and spark a roaring fire. Quick thinking on Squiddy's part ensured he raided the kitchen for three boxes of frozen beef burgers, a 40 pence Aldi white loaf, HP brown sauce, and most crucially, the oven's middle grate. Chrissy struggles in getting through even one single patty burger, a measly meal size, even for the stick insect he is. Squiddy has no such appetite-related qualms and scoffs down four brown sauce-drenched double burgers to celebrate his temporary homecoming. To wash down the salty beef, he whacks out half a bottle of Bell's whiskey and sinks it down in under 45 minutes, frantically mosh-pitting to Queen of the Stone Age's self-titled album that screeches off his outdated foam. With no use left for the bottle, he thunders it onto the floor, but with another four litre to burn, Squiddy continues making the most of his night while Chrissy shuts his eyes. After a few sleepless hours, he banishes Squiddy to the bathroom. Managing only a torridly disrupted few hours kip owing to the misshapen floorboard-based bed, sunlight beaming onto Chrissy's face wakes him up as he wrings out his desert-dry, parched mouth. Lying coverless on his side, he shivers and dreads the tedious day in hiding ahead. Without their almighty sound system, it's simply not the same here for Chrissy. Being left with Squiddy's second-hand, outdated CEX phone as their sole source of base makes a mockery of the place's history, leaving the nickname Base Camp languishing in dire jeopardy. Chrissy starts off the morning with a two-gram warhead spliff in hope of knocking himself back out. Pitifully uneducated political debate from loud, UKIP-supporting scaffolders on KFC's roof ensures no size spliff is up to that task. After finally finding a safe plug in the bathroom, Squiddy spent the night rinsing through Black Sabbath's entire discography and is roaring for another day of tunes and booze. Left with half a bottle of scotch and with breakfast burgers well and truly on the go, Squiddy hams out a regimented set of 40 fist press-ups behind Chrissy, a lifelong rule of his being to punish himself physically for every half bottle of spirits he devours. Chapter 4. Bistro I. Thomas's first few months of distant grieving only amplified his inept presence in Shaz's life, who's been left to suffer visceral despondency alone without so much as a visit from the family. Throwing himself into work is how Thomas stayed calm, and two weeks in, a promotion came his way, against all odds, 
a landmark he'd been vying for for a decade. Not that it was on pure merit, nor out of sympathy. Big Al, the slimy, cynical manager of the industrial-sized car insurance call centre, had simply run out of viable options. A dismal career there until now had seen him purposely kept at bay, shoved in a supervisory box, dangled the possible prestige of management in his desperate eyes without the slightest intention of following through. So never did he expect to run his own team. However, they're the place's worst performing unit. Adrenaline blinkered this reality for a small while, but the reasons why soon became apparent. A gnarly collective booze and cocaine culture. Fed up with the elaborate, mumbled dawn time voice messages asking for last minute sick days constantly leaving him short staffed, Thomas is bringing a new drugs policy into play. Bumbling in at 6am, he sticks up hundreds of posters stating mandatory monthly drug testing for all employees starting on the 7th. Non compliance and positive tests will result in the immediate termination of your contract in front of the building and around his unit. More affected by his own reputation than his son's death, this is part of a subconscious plan in covering all angles to ensure nobody thinks for a second he somehow encouraged Sam on his path to drugs. Rudely disturbed from their local drug dealer tip trading, panic sets in as the sleep-deprived, come-down ridden, Stop out call handlers slowly waddle in for another glorious day in paradise. This is a nightmare for over three quarters of the unit's staff and the mounds of dealers to whom they owe tick money. Needless to say, Thomas is duly reported, and by 10 a.m., Big Al strips him of his dream, demoted down two ranks to where it all started. Back on customer retention, a frontline phone peasant once again, effective immediately. Chrissy stood serving a family of five with a smart, pressed black shirt on his back and a notepad and pen in hand at Bistro I, a cheap restaurant where he now waits on. Yes, and finally a Pinot Grigio, says Tracy, the family's well-spoken mother, who specifically requested Chrissy as waiter for their third visit running. Josephine sticks an ice cube in her younger sibling's apple juice, eager as ever to show off in front of Chrissy. Have a bit of that. Pack it in. You won't be getting any cheesecake if you carry on. Tracy warns. Oh, Josephine. Could be a right disaster, that. Chrissy playfully adds as he theatrically rips off the order slip and turns to Josephine while walking away. Bit of barbecue on the side. Not touching anything. Chrissy's guilt spiralled following his role in Sam's demise, which subconsciously pushed him to get two jobs. One here and the other at the Heart Pub both being his first legitimate means of employment. Despite only having worked at the bistro for three weeks, he already holds quite the reputation among punters for his speedy service and well-disguised glib charm. Starved of drug dealing's lucrative profits, Chrissy is, however, brassic for the first time in years. Stuck in a lurch for two more weeks until the first paychecks, a taxi's out of the question and he's left to trudge the two-mile trek home through torrential rain to the heart, tediously left with an hour gap in between shifts to loiter. Owing to his former four-to-seven-gram-a-day weed habit, Chrissy's cravings remain ravenous a month later. Following a recent pledge to drastically limit his intake to a bedtime joint or two, resisting the fierce urge to optimise his hour break with a spliff at home en route, He'll have to settle for a lonely wait in the Harp's creepy basement staff room with a pre-packed plastic box of cold chicken pasta. Unable to hack the eerie basement after 20 sketchy paranormal minutes, he heads out for a quick fire, four fag chain smoke session to blow the last of his break. Such has his cigarette smoking level increased as his body re to lacking cocaine and Valium, he's now resorted to smoking Benson and Hedges rolling tobacco ditching his beloved Marlboro Gold straights to save on money. With the fourth fag down to his last drags, a brief glance inside confirms the place is chock-a-block full of rowdy, lightweight students, as deeply dreaded. Never before working here has Chrissy set foot in a pub sober, and the place's hawk-eyed accountant cuts out all leeway in sneaking the odd pint of Lefe to get through the shifts. 
No sooner as Chrissy logs onto a till. Old farmer's hat wearing hunchback, Gwyndav Roland stumbles in, defying his age of 55 by presenting as a pensioner. Without doubt having timed his grand arrival for the start of Chrissy's shift, the sole member of staff passive enough to rope in to his incessant nattering. Without a single formality, today's opening hot topic is Gwyndav's five freeview picks of the week, all discussed in depth using thoroughly memorised teasers from the Sun newspaper's television pullout. Now warmed up and raring to go, Gwyndav's on to his top eight of all-time freeview channels. Sky Sports News, QVC and Dave Plus One complete Gwyndav's unorthodox top three. Hurt by the lack of response, Gwyndav bombards a flailing Chrissy for his own top eight as he struggles in keeping up with the bar's blistering pace, left alone after Yola called yet another cocaine-induced psychosis sickie. Chrissy names Babe Station as number one, and then channels one to seven as the rest. Didn't even think of Babe Station, lad. Fuck all that Netflix bollocks. Couple of jars instead. Won't see me paying for telly. Gwyndav defiantly announces. Chrissy frantically pours 20 shots of Fireball for Trev, who, according to a 10,000-person Facebook poll, is Banger Uni's number one ranked drinker of all time. Garbage, innit? Waste of time, boy. Under siege, yeah? And fucking on deadly ground. Back to back, film four last night. Chrissy rolls his eyes. Thought you were die-hard talking pictures. Right down the shit, so that's gone. No loyalty in the freeview world. Chrissy's shift continues in similarly tedious fashion as Gwyndav unloads his least favourite five Wu-Tang songs with surprisingly in-depth intellectual analysis. Not a second past 11 o'clock, Chrissy risks his boss's wrath by shutting early in hope of an early night, a luxury that's been in short supply as of late. Ever since Sam's death, the amount of sashes popping around and staying at the house has skyrocketed due to Squiddy's unfiltered, relaxed policy on comings and goings. As predicted, Squiddy's new favourite genre Gabba blares from the house as Chrissy approaches, heard as far away as the street corner. Unable to face the inevitable barrage of heckling for getting a job and cutting down on drugs, Chrissy delicately opens the front door and tiptoes upstairs. Having relinquished his wholesale dealer status, people like Gitter, Warren and Llewellyn Tick see Chrissy in an entirely different light. They simply cannot fathom why someone would give up an emerging local enterprise and sell their phone full of customers to Squiddy for £200. Pathetic amount considering the £500 to £1,000 of daily business it brings in. That's without them having a clue that he's recently started college. A fact he'll never live down if found out. But it's for that reason he's taking an early night. At least, that's what he hopes for. A three-hour doze is all that can be mustered. Squiddy sprinting up and down the stairs 50 times to stave off an imminent heart attack while on a rough acid trip being the tip of the debauchery iceberg of things keeping him awake. When Chrissy finally emerges for breakfast before college, he finds Gitto, Jasmine, Squiddy, Llewellyn, Shane and Mikey sprawled out on the floor, all scattered around Mikey's bed among a variety of broken glass and vomit barely affording Chrissy the space to reach his smoothie maker. Shredding of wonky strawberries, bananas and oranges abruptly awakes Gitter. He scowls and turns the other way, set for a sleep-deprived day with a stinging head and 1p LSD still swarming through his senses. Chrissy blags his interview for the Access to Social Sciences diploma course by announcing his intention of becoming a counsellor in future a strategy that duly worked and got him a place on the course that, if passed, will bag him a slot at university. So far, he's taken well to the first few weeks of classes, particularly thriving during psychology lessons. Their blonde curly-haired, charismatic teacher Gwen bangs on about Maslow's hierarchy of needs with its model stuck up on the blackboard. Students of a wide range of ages surround Chrissy, with most listening on intently. Chrissy struggled with longer lessons, and two hours into this one, his attention span is well and truly off the rails. And when all this has been met, a tricky feat for even the wealthiest and wisest among the shambolic excuse of his society, we can, we have a chance to reach the legendary 
but still vaguely defined state of self-actualization. And what is that? Most of you will no doubt be at least here. Gwen points at a steam on the model with a pen. Sophie Folks, a tall, slender, dark blonde-haired attractive student, glances over and smirks subtly at Chrissy, fixated by his brown, padded second-hand leather jacket. As he eventually notices, Sophie looks down at her notes. Gwen regains her composure after being sidetracked by the pair's flittering eyes. Simply based on having the drive to be where you are, all trying to further your lives. Some of you have left huge jobs, put financial stability on the back burner, and for that, we'll give you everything we've got to help. When the time for a break finally beckons, Chrissy heads straight for the generic green bus shelter used as the college's smoking area. To fuel up for the afternoon's three-hour maths lesson, he rolls a cigar roll-up treble his usual serving size and sticks the pouch back in his pocket. Craving some human contact, Sophie sneaks up behind, digs her hand into his pocket and yanks out the pouch. Oi oi. Chrissy shuffles back a step in shock. Didn't reckon you'd mind. Sophie flirtatiously says. Chrissy smirks, sensing he might be onto his first bit of action in months. Fag, I don't. Violation of my personal space? Well... Camera's pointing the other way, I'm afraid. That's compo out the window, then. Devastating. Sophie theatrically throws her arms into the air. Join me for a jar after. I might just about forgive you. Sophie smoothly lights her fag with a wry smile. There's no doubt that she'll partake. But not after making the goofball squirm a bit first. Thomas pulls into his middle-class, detached housing street in a finance-acquired black BMW after a day from hell. A migraine three hours in stifled his already fragile nerves on his first day back in customer attention. Being somewhat of an outcast after the drug policy stunt, nobody bothered helping as he struggled in readapting to the rapid-paced role. After falling short of his conversion target by 85%, he will no doubt be shown the door within weeks without vast improvement. Before heading inside to face his toxic marriage, Thomas chains a few fags, limiting it to three on this occasion with his newly reduced wages firmly in mind. Connor strolls out of their house and blows Shaz a kiss by the door. Caught unaware in a basketball betting research daze, Thomas jolts up, stumps out his fag and bursts out of the car. How's it going, Connor? Can't thank you and the boys enough for coming another day. Thomas vigorously shakes Connor's hand. In true attention-seeking fashion, Connor, Skillin and Chin arrived at the funeral alongside their heftiest 18-stone cousins in a banged-up, red 90s Toyota they could barely fit in, rocking up in the last minutes before Sam's ceremony to ensure all of the six present were in no doubt as to their appearance. You were our cousin, Connor piercingly says. Meant the world to our Shaz. He were as sweet as anyone, your Sam. Never deserved that. Proper family, you. Only one who's come to see us will never forget. Only the start, Connor mutters as he steps closer to Thomas. Don't you let her fucking bev like that for much longer. Thomas heads inside with a pounding heart after what was intended as leisure time before facing home life's grind. Shaz sits vacantly at the table with a large three-quarter full glass of Chardonnay and a rock of hash by its side. A brazen first having spent the last 12 years limited to smoking at friends' houses on the sly. Wearing thin pyjamas while blasting the gas fire on full whack internally grinds Thomas's gears, not least after recently treating her to two sets of thicker winter pyjamas. But having promised Shaz to at least cut down on the stinginess, he keeps stum. Shaz rolls a hash noodle in her fingers and dangles it into a king-size spliff without looking Thomas's way. Early today, Shaz mutters. Thomas glares at their skinny, delinquent gardener outside pulling weeds in a baggy t-shirt and size, dreading the imminent awkward conversation regarding his sacking. He hastily unbuttons his shirt, throws it on the sofa and storms into the kitchen. We're going to do a wash if you leave it out back. Shaz half-heartedly proposes. Surplus to requirements. Thomas cracks open a 660 milliliter bottle of Bax, takes a hefty swig 
and pours the rest into a pub salvaged pint glass. Initially slow to cotton on, Shaz lifts her hazy head and flares out her nostrils. Don't tell me you've had the sack. Back on phones. Thomas nonchalantly fires back, already dreading the hostile evening ahead. What do you mean, back on the phones? Twenty years of your life they've had. Two empty wine bottles stand in the recycling bin. Two by only 2.30pm. Thomas closes his eyes. She's nothing short of a nightmare after passing the two bottle mark. Let alone when dealt with crushing news. Beamer's going to have to go back then. Gardener's on the door. Dazzling day for him and his newborn. No, no, sod that. Foss will get done for diddling books again and I'll have it to back within the year. What daft excuse did you give them? Thomas scowls and wipes a stain off the kitchen surface. Could not hack all the chatter about sniffing this, chonging that, all bastard day. Shaz rubs her face, opens a window and lights the joint. Now you can do, for what they chat about. So I said anyone who fails a drug test, you're out of a job. Thomas assertively states, already close to polishing off his first pint. Oh, now you decide you got a backbone, eh? Had it, I had. Never gave a shit till now. What have you done? We'll make it work. There's no graft for me till tourists are here. I bloody well like to know how. Shop elsewhere of m and both cut down on booze intake. Shaz gets up and storms into the kitchen. What are you trying to say? Never has Thomas dared question her booze intake. Fearful of a slap, he cowers into the corner, takes three cold slices of meat feast pizza out the fridge and sticks them in the microwave. Wouldn't be a disaster, would it? Nerve on you today. Where did your addiction get us, eh? Telling Sam we were going fucking races. Now left to bring him over some food money. I didn't go races and he died thinking I were part of that. We all make mistakes, Thomas. But you fucking come in here and tell me to cut down after what's just happened. And you're fucking rolling it. He would have had anything I sent him up his hooter. Them creeps he lived with. He only smoked green here and there. You're off it. You believe that. He couldn't sleep with the racket. I saw his statements the whole time. He were no fiend like us. All they had on there were food shopping deliveries. Two twenty bag a month on the 7th and 21st without fail and no more than four pints when he were on the rag. Despite banishing Thomas and his snoring to the sofa, Shaz has barely slept leading up to this dreaded police interview and can barely string a sentence together. Three fag stumps sit in an ashtray she slowly adds to. Bert Copperfield, the deceitfully tame, sharply dressed detective sergeant sat opposite, looks on empathetically. In aid of her fragile state, Bert kindly waived police station smoking policies by cracking open a window and whacking a sock over the fire alarm. I'd been made aware of the presence within Sam's former dwellings of a Chrissy Bray. Quite the rural bandit, someone we definitely have our eye on. Bert peeks down at his notes. Shaz suppresses the urge to grimace and keeps a straight face. There was also an abnormally high level of Valium in Sam's system at the time of his death. Now, when I say abnormal, I mean for a non or very occasional user. So, you're absolutely sure Sam was familiar with drugs? Bloody right. Knew all about them from his dealing and that. Never used to take much mind. Shaz taps the side of her head. Businessman and half. But last few year... Shaz takes a deep breath and shrugs. Hard to say no in uni. So much of it on him and all. Bert subtly rolls his eyes, frustrated by their lack of progress. We had our suspicions that Chrissy, or one of his goons, may have had a hand in this, see? Shaz shakes her head. Sam's life were always going to go that way. Choices he made. All his own doing. At least my lad ain't hurting now vulnerable anymore. And those boys who were selling for him, they've got a chance at life now. After tactfully dissociating for another 20 strenuous minutes, Shaz can't get out of the place fast enough. 
She passes by the reception, determined to keep it all in while repeatedly slamming the exit button. Finally, it edges open and she jogs down the road before vomiting in a bush. Never has she lied in such a capacity, but knowing Chrissy gets off the hook makes every second of this brief, inner anguish, a breeze. Chapter 5 HMP Bedwin Special After their introductory few jars, Chrissy and Sophie became an item from that very night and have proven inseparable and damagingly codependent for the five months since. It didn't take long until Chrissy wormed himself into her friend group, with the smooth process fast-tracked by being the only one not living with parents and subsequently having a house for them to party in after college. To accommodate this new demand while shielding the soft lot from Squiddy and Co, Chrissy's recently leased Sam's old room, paying double rent on top of that for his own. Strangely, however, he's kept the majority of it intact, including no less than Sam's six-foot Bradford FC flag stuck up on the wall. Joining him and Sophie for today's old-school hip-hop dominated post-college bash is Lucas, a stereotypical-looking scene kid, and his darkly dressed, somewhat distant, infinity pool-obsessed girlfriend Bev. All sit in a circle drinking budget beer while playing the card-drinking game Pyramid. Sophie turns over a card on tier five. It's a three. Cards are split into five tiers, in a pyramid shape, with the surplus cards evenly dished out between the players. Flipping over a card on tier 5 means whoever has that card, which is a 3 in this case, designates someone in the circle to take 5 swigs of their drink. Chrissy has two threes that he chucks down before pointing at Sophie. Having two of them gives him the ability to designate her the entire 10 swigs, or give 5 to her and 5 to someone else. Get it down ya, Chrissy demands. Sophie smirks sarcastically and downs her beer. With it soon apparent her current drink won't last ten swigs, she throws Chrissy the bottle opener, and he passes over another. After devouring her swigs without so much as a wince, Sophie turns over another tier five card that's a six. She jabs Chrissy in the stomach and whacks three cards down on six, dishing him out a mandatory fifteen swigs. Miserable git. That'll show you. Sophie insists. Chrissy ferociously chugs his beer while Bev takes a light swig of hers. Dish it out a bit. Fucking parched over here. Lucas restlessly barks. You don't have to wait for the game to tell you when to drink. Bev clinically says. Lucas looks down, furious by his own robotic tendencies after five consecutive secret New Year resolutions to toughen up and take control of life. He takes an awkward swig of his beer. Following a night bent over the bog, chundering every quarter of an hour, Chrissy's criminally ill-prepared for his debut at Sophie's wealthy parents' oversized, oval-shaped dinner table. Overwhelmed by the £5 million house's Victorian beauty, he struggles to keep his cool during Sophie's grey-haired, condescending Father Reginald's subtle grilling. After being left his father's international property portfolio, he's a man who's worked for nothing in life. A situation fully taken advantage of by his stunningly dressed up, aristocratic wife Joan, who's in their loveless marriage for the long haul. Chrissy fights to keep the beef wellington, green beans and red wine down. So did your parents get you into social sciences, Chrissy? Joan breaks the cutting silence. We think it's terrific that Sophie's taken it up. Reginald says, clearly overcompensating for his sheer spite. Well... If you consider their alternative parenting methods sparking an overwhelming desire to learn about the mind, then I guess they did, Chrissy improvises. Reginald sniggers, utterly seething at Chrissy's openness that he painfully wishes he had. Sophie chuckles, revelling in the sketchy, awkward clash of styles. What is it that they do? Reginald mutters after stepping out of his bitter days. Father, as far as I know... Fancies himself a bit of an old punk rocker. Mother. Well, whatever the wonderful Don tells her to. Joan chokes on a gulp of her wine and delicately wipes the droplets off her lip. Reginald grimaces and stares down at his food. Already despondent about missing Channel 4 racing for this, let alone being made to feel threatened and inferior for his lack of backbone. 
Mikey lays on his springy mattress, pouring two cans of budget beer into a stein at a time. Armed with a £325 government cost of living bursary, he's primed for an all-dayer with one of his primary drinking buddy replacements, Franny Harps Harper. A scruffy, stumpy guy wearing worn-out, decades-old, low-level chav clothing. Franny vigorously chugs a can of special brew, frequently spitting through a gap in his front teeth as he rages on. There's nothing he's missed more than Banga High Street drama. A regular contributor himself to the chaos, Franny's newly released from a nine-month prison sentence. Actual bodily harm being the charge on this occasion, specifically for breaking an old customer's jaw with a knuckle duster outside KFC over a seven-year-old, £40 ketamine debt. Chrissy's new friend group's tag-along Jack Jones, an ingenuous, colourful top-man check shirt-wearing lad, stands on the other side of the open-plan room on group food duties. Thoroughly intimidated by Franny, he anxiously spreads red pesto on tortilla wraps with a spoon. Despite Jack's initial hesitancy in using the kitchen, Chrissy cynically insisted that the lads in there will just be doing their Welsh back essay. Wouldn't have even got my dog fucked up, Franny says. Fuming like this he was. He theatrically bends his back and clenches his fist. Want my water back now? Mikey falls back in hysterics, dramatised further by the afterglow of ten quick-fire recent NOS balloons to a backdrop of Gabba. And he fucking... <clears throat> Franny pretends to throw a powerful knee to Mikey's head. Little did he know. Three metal plates. Franny strokes his forehead. Old man used to batter him when he was four. Little did our bars know. Crater face cunt he's nutted. Straight up. And he even robbed Baz's beers before he fucked off. Baz is out like this. Franny rolls on the floor holding his knee. Ah! ah. Franny gets up and leans near to Mikey's face. Slapped his kneecap flat in half, man. Holy shit! Franny chops up a few fag ends with dirty scissors to make a skinny roll up. Not only that. Franny cracks up. Cops rock up. Won't even take the dozy cunts way and he. Not right, that. How's he now? Fucking coma. Hell of an after-op infection. Franny looks down with a grimace. This soon evaporates at the sight of Jack pulling two double tortilla-based pizzas from the oven. No way, man. HMP Bedouin special, them. Oh, yeah? Jack sensitively says. You used to cane these, lad. Franny takes one of the pizzas. Ever get sent down, eh? Franny squashes the pizza together. Fucking like that. He holds it in between a gap in the heater. Keep it there three, four minutes. Franny looks down towards Mikey. He ponders before nodding. The... the cook, mate. Jack stutters. I'm only showing you. Franny defensively claims. He stares down menacingly at the pizza in hand. Chrissy, Lucas and Sophie cheer on the group's star peggle player Bev as she targets a new high score. Jack nudges his way into Sam's old room, evidently struggling as his matchstick arms tremble while holding four plates with a pizza on each, one of which bearing a gap tooth bite mark. What on earth is that savourless drivel? Sophie sniggers. Audi skint lad special. Four pizzas, three bar. Jack defiantly announces. Chrissy and Lucas swamp Jack, taking three of the plates and leaving him with the bitten pizza. He looks down before sticking it on the windowsill, praying it's swiped by a seagull or rat. Shaz vacantly sips from a bottle of Newcastle Ale in a cheap, tacky service station cafe with Connor. Cars fly down the busy motorway behind her. Can't tell you how proud I am of you, Connor says. Shaz's face sinks. Could have done that myself, I would have. Tears lightly roll down Shaz's cheek. Hey, you're done. Nailed it, you. Sit back now. Rest is sorted. Connor puts his hand on hers. Shaz giggles and nods. Soppiest thing but in Bickerton history. Shaz shakes her head. Uncle Todd slices your rugby ball for nicking a few egg. And you, so calm and collected here, peg it 40-odd mile to all on foot. <laughs> we weren't that far. Freezing your little bollocks off on side of road. <sighs> I think you at least rival me for that award. 
After parting ways with Shaz, Connor cruises down the motorway in his new black family carrier at 80 miles an hour with a progressively bursting, determined smile as Jimi Hendrix blasts through the speaker. Time to meet Chin and Skillin at one of their rural meeting spots, a day he's been relishing for months. A mile long, bumpy track is all that separates him. As the bottom of the car rattles repeatedly on the jagged rocks sticking out from the shoddy farm track, Connor's customary road rage and car damage anxiety is nowhere to be seen. Chin and Skillin rock up 25 minutes late in their banged up red Toyota. Not that Connor could care less as he embraces them both. Skillin's past a hold all, their lifeline in form of a few ounces of weed, a half ounce of cocaine and a paper map of Bangor in its surrounding villages, where Chin and Skillin are to temporarily relocate. Their collective plan? A simple one. Slowly ruin Chrissy's life. Ensuring he got off scot-free with the police being their perfect start. Connor's undertaken extensive research on the area. Chrissy's habits, where he lives, the absolute lot. Now, it's down to Skillin and Chin to build on that knowledge by initially scoping the area out, with hope that their drugs serve as a gateway into the dealing community and act as a connection maker. In what is hoped will be an additional aggravating factor, Connor's even located Squiddy and Chrissy's beloved base camp, designating it as the lads' temporary home. As a token for taking the time out of their lives, leaving behind young families to honour the Barry name, Connor hands over the people carrier's keys, which they will be allowed to keep long after the mission. Skillin's on driving duty, as per Connor's strict request, who, as another gift, secretly left dozens of cartons of pall mall fags stuffed into the open glove compartment and boot, a gesture Skillin takes full advantage of as he tears open his second pack before passing Krill on the A55, a mere three hours in. Chin carefully crafts paper maps of their key banger checkpoints, given both are fiercely instructed to use their mobiles as sparingly as possible. What if we go bare instinctual in that? Skillin suddenly says, having been left a quiet space to ponder. Eh? Chin restlessly looks up, having been burst out of his deep focus. Just fucking scrand dirt cheap little tins of food. Chin rolls his eyes and gets back down to mat drawing. All I'm thinking, we've all minimal, and all we have to do is sling a few point sixes to some little gimps. Skillin pitches. No way about it, Skill. You're doing the gear this time? Chin fiercely reminds him. Bagheads, old man. Nightmare they are. Last time, this bird, right? Skillin puffs out his cheeks. You know that horrible drizzly summer he sent me to? Chin half-heartedly nods, knowing to let Skillin get all the bird-related bragging out of his system in hope of a peaceful last half hour of the journey. She were all right in that, you know. Pretty fit if she hadn't been a baghead. Anyway, all over me she were. So I thought... Fuck it, and let her have away with me. Didn't charge her out for a bit of while. She were worth it, fair play. Low job at months, maybe even year. Chin lets that sit, and it proves to be their last collective word uttered until reaching Bangor, 40 minutes of 90 mile an hour speeding later. They park a few minutes walk away from base camp, and after a strenuous lug of their suitcases and bags, Chin smashes through the glass pane door. One Squiddy had only days ago painstakingly patched up with knowledge from a YouTube tutorial. Owing to a semi-sturdy plank bridge laid by Squiddy, neither has to deal with clearing the three-metre ledge. Chin grimaces at the dreary pit as he rids his aching shoulders of the heavy bags' his burden. Skillin stumbles on one of the floorboard's litany of holes as the heavy bags pull him to the floor. He wipes the dusty debris off his white hoodie and leans against the battered, mouldy cream wall. They abandon plans of a Netflix binge with Tesco Meat Feast Pizza after thinking better of testing the questionable safety of the oven's electrics. Instead, opting for a well-deserved few pints and to scope out Skerries, where they're pleasantly surprised by the dirt cheap prices. It's as busy and rowdy as any pub they've set foot in, given the fiercely contested weekly £30 jackpot pub quiz being in its final category. Limited to a local village pub a 10 mile round trip away back in their hometown, the bustle of Skerries slightly overalls the pair for 10 minutes or so. 
Skilling's fury at waiting 15 minutes to be served vanishes when not asked to present ID by the barman. A proud first-time feat. He wouldn't have made out of the other lads kip there, man. Chin insists. Best ones for the job, my ass. Skilling mutters. Chin spots Chrissy lounged back in a cubicle with Sophie, both chatty and cheerful, despite depriving one another of any sleep last night. He stares at them while sipping his Carlsberg before he and Skilling head out to the bustling backyard. Another culture shock awaits as the place is stacked with seven pint deep skaters and rockers reaping harmless havoc. They find a spot opposite a heavily made up, blonde haired girl Mared, who sat alone smoking in a black dress. Despite being in a new, happy relationship, Skillin spends the next half hour trying his luck, playing the Ghibli concerned protector. But to come out by yourself, what are you thinking? Skillin asks. Nothing happens to you here. Mared snaps back, far from relishing the attention. So what? You walk here and back, all on your little lonesome? A few miles, eh? And what? Mared unapologetically says. Ditto wobbles around after a tad too much ketamine, working his way through every individual table, asking if there's any decent green or bash about, in the hope of straightening out his spinning head. All responses vary from flat out blanking the boy to telling him to fuck off. Chin fixates on him, admiring what he sees. Could be just the docile little prick they need to get things moving. Skilling ignores Chin's tap of the shoulder. You were my missus. I'd be dead woodied me. Mate! Chin barks. What? Skilling turns back to Chin with a snarl. Any green or bash about? Gitto asks a nearby table. Chin shrugs his shoulders as Skilling smirks, rolls up his sleeves and struts over to Gitto. After bringing out all the tricks that earned him his secondary school nickname Slick Skilling, Gitto soon won over with the aid of free cocaine tasters. Within a few keys, Gitto snaps up a gram, and after claiming to have missed the last bus back to their hotel, Chin and Skillin are welcomed back to his family home for an all-nighter on the lines and beers. Skillin takes the opportunity to bag up a few ounces of their weed into grams, asserting his presence and testing Gitto's boundaries, scoping out what use he might be to them. Dawn sunlight soon withers through the grisly North Wales rain clouds. Gittel's hyperactive, primary school age siblings getting ready for their day dishes them a rude awakening of the imminent stinging come down bound to blight their next day or two. All the more reason to keep it going, as Gittel devours the penultimate line of his second grand bag of the night. Proper gay ahead. But you don't even have a dealer? Chin says. Not a good one anyway. Bastard retired. Gitto resentfully mutters. Chin perks right up. There can't be many retired dealers in the area, so they may well have found a Chrissy Inside Knowledge gold mine on day one. Gitto offers the plate to Chin, who politely shakes his head. Gitto's accommodating mother, Jean, sheepishly knocks on the door, and they snap into action, shoving all their cocaine plates under the bed. I've done you all fry-ups. Jean muffles through the closed door. Can you leave them outside, please? Sure. Gitto breathes a heavy sigh of relief. Dioch, ma'am. Ta, Jean. Yeah, spot on, Jean. Skilling mumbles. After an awkward pause, they all wildly cackle, muffling the outbursts with their hands over their mouths. Sensing old Jean's now out of earshot, Gitto snorts his last line as a small bag of weed lands on his lap. Nice one. Gitto gratefully holds it up. Can I bag a few more up? Skilling points to the work surface. Uh, yeah, whatever, sure. Skilling turns away and grins. Always one to celebrate getting his own way and tearing people out of their comfort zone. Chin offers Gitto a fag, that he admiringly accepts. Nice one. Chin keeps the box held dangled over towards Gitto. Have the lot, mate. Yeah. Chin shrugs with his hands out. Gitto cautiously takes the pack and smiles visibly enjoying the first toke of his night's 30th fag. He used to graph for Chrissy a bit, you know, Gittel says with pride as he finally starts feeling comfortable in his surroundings. Proper graph to you then, Chin says. I'd like to think so. Chin and Skillin briefly lock eyes, desperately trying not to crack up. 
was until he went all boring. Miserable fox, now one of them narcotic anonymous pricks. Get up bitterly adds. Chin rolls his eyes. Can't be having that. I know. Now, I can't get any myself. Fuck all dank enough to keep up my rep anyway. Gitto wipes smash off his leather jacket. Now you do. Skilling points out. Gitto smiles. Just a shame is all. Because he used to have mad sessions he did. The place to be. Like no other. Now, now he's snoozing early. Fucking smoothie in the morning. Bagged a bird who can barely handle a jar. What the fuck? How do you change so dramatically? Anyone else there kept it going or what? Oh yeah, his old mates are still well on it. You boys are sessions, eh? Gitto looks at both Chin and Skillin, who nod back. On that note, they head down to the town centre, where the sesh never stops. True to its reputation, the door's unlocked, and to Gitto's relief, Mikey and Franny are spending this morning right on the gin. Gitto powers ahead, leaving Chin the chance to peek through the unclosable door's gap of Sam's old room, and in doing so, can't believe his luck. Chrissy's out at college. Never had he thought they'd get so far on day one. Pretending to have been for a piss, Chin adjusts his belt while trundling back into the kitchen, when Mikey and Franny barely notice his presence. Gitto, Chin and Skillin form an expectant crowd to their sloppy round of kitchen boxing, both a shadow of their usual selves after necking four Xanax each only hours ago. Chin looks on pitifully at the pair, itching to take them on and show them a real boxer. Sensing the crowd passively urging him forward, Franny throws a powerful overhand right that Mikey ducks. As his head bounces back up, Mikey lands a hard straight to Franny's bladder, sending him crashing to his feet in agony. Oh, low blow that lad, Franny splutters. TKO, TKO! Mikey chants with raised fists. Franny jumps to his feet, the sense of injustice seeing him fully healed in an instant. No fucking way, man! TKO my ass. Franny wags his finger in Mikey's smug face. Within kitchen box and remits, I'm afraid. Skilling interjects. Had you a bomb points the lot? Gitto adds. Fuck off, harps lad. Piss off and get this tumpies in. Oldie's been open an hour, boy. Mikey chugs Carlsberg out of a brimming two-litre jug. Chin takes his chance in the midst of Franny's wild protestations and sneaks out quietly shutting the kitchen door as he tiptoes to Sam's old room. Using a code on a list full of Chrissy's passwords compiled by Connor with the help of a Fiverr freelancer, Chin logs onto Chrissy's laptop. Nationwide is the first stop, and to his bemusement, he's allowed straight into Chrissy's account. It doesn't take long to find what he needs, and Chin scribbles down Chrissy's customer number and login details. Next on the list is to take notes of Chrissy's Papa Roach, Massive Attack and Static X dominated iTunes library, with the aim of working out what Chrissy might particularly despise. With time in the bank, it's time for a bit of extracurricular digging beyond that asked of him by Connor, for a bit of fun. Chin comes across a notepad titled NA Diary Organizer, Pathway to Progress, and chuckles at a frilly 3D heart sketch with Sophie written in the middle. After ripping a few useful pages out, he gets up to leave before recalling the exercise's most crucial aspect, surveillance. Chin hides a tiny camera amongst a few of Sam's football-themed hardback books and tests the connection out to an app on his phone, hopefully giving them unbridled 24-7 access. With it working perfectly, displaying a useful wide angle, with most of the room in shot, he stares into the lens beaming his cheesy grin onto his phone screen. Shaz braves the bitter cold while chopping small pieces of firewood with a miniature axe in her sloped garden as Bob Dylan's album Desire plays off her phone. Just as her favourite song, Oh Sister, starts, the phone rings, which means, owing to her OCD, she'll have to replay the album from the start. She stops axing, sighs after seeing it's Thomas, rips a glove off with her teeth and answers the call. Thomas is sitting in a busy and smoky Mallorca pub's beer garden after taking a trip away with his redundancy payment. Scarlet faced after necking four pint cans in an hour and a half. Promising Bradford student drug dealer pays the ultimate price for washing bango with drugs. His mother Sharon Sullivan was quoted as saying, 
He'd always had a secret life littered in the consumption and distribution of narcotics. I feared this day would come. Thomas fiercely reads from the newspaper. That desperate f- few bob, eh? Lying fucking cow. Bit more to it than that. How could you? Shaz lights a fag. That greasy bang or fuck supplies the end of our son's life. Get away with it, does he? No prison, why? Us are made out to be shitty parents. On record, forever. You wait till I get back. The only shitty parent were you. Absent when needed. Fruitless, sorry, pain in the fucking ass. when not. We don't deal with police. My family. Forget, don't you? All of my heritage you tried stripping of me that I let you. Not this fucking time. No police, Thomas. You don't want to go there. Shaz hangs up, thumps some wood with the axe and lobs it into a bustling white sack. Tired of both the house's stench and Franny's yammering, this time about how the 1984 Commonwealth Games boxing judges all deserve the death penalty for cheating banger boxer Dave Davis out of a gold medal, Chin and Skilling call it a night and stumble out of Chrissy's house. An icy gust of wind ignites the shivering tingle of Skilling's brutal, ominous come down, and he zips up his hoodie to stave it off. Chrissy, Lucas, Bev, Sophie, and Jack head towards the house carrying shopping bags full of booze, ready for another post college knees up. As they pass by, Sophie jumps on Jack's back and he drops the bag, shattering the Cronenbergs inside. Chrissy glares at Sophie in horror. Last of my EMA, that! Jack melts down in a dramatic hissy fit. Can tell you didn't cough up. Carelessness or what? Chrissy bitterly adds. Sophie gives Jack the middle finger. Didn't say shit when you chugged my 80 quid plum wine, did I, Jack Jones? Three bloody weeks it took to ship in more. Skilling glances admiringly at Sophie's ass as she stomps her way to the shop in a huff. Bringing back a litre and a half of vodka ensures any bad blood is swiftly buried as all immediately neck three shots each and engage in a round-robin arm wrestling tournament. Firm in his belief that blatant peacocking over superior physicality is immoral, Lucas looks on in insecurity masked by self-righteous sniggering. Using sports science theories as an excuse, Chrissy massages Sophie's neck before her every match, only to be embarrassingly caught doing so as Squiddy stumbles into the room. Fresh from an all-night solo rave, He's spangled drunk with a nasty snarl, stopping everyone in their tracks as this alpha male whirlwind infiltrates their space. Wrong room. Chrissy lightly grapples Squiddy in an attempt to push him out. Squiddy ferociously resists and powers forward. Fuck that. Come in here. I'm coming in here to sesh with the hippies. Mikey's in the other room, man. Chrissy impatiently says. Fuck Mikey. And that assault by penetration little fuck he's with. Squiddy shouts out into the corridor. Dearly hoping that Franny will hear. I'm chilling with the hippies. All right. Everyone wearily looks away, praying they don't lock eyes with Squiddy in a unanimous downturn of the collective atmosphere. Chrissy eventually gives up and sits back down, silently mouthing sorry to Sophie on the way. Squiddy stumbles over towards Jack, who drops his barely smoked cigarette in the ashtray and holds out his hand to shake, which is ignored. Squiddy stuffs his hand in the ashtray, picks out Jack's fag and another smaller dimp, puts them in his mouth, and while attempting to light both with the same flame, the smaller dimp falls on the floor. Struggling to maintain balance, he stumbles into the bookshelf and punches its side. After glancing at the books, then over to Chrissy, he scoffs before grabbing out Fever Pitch and inverting the pyramid, flicking roughly through the pages with little regard for the book's preservation. Hippie student of the year, you I, Squiddy sarcastically says. Oh, uh, I did hear I was nominated. Chrissy unconvincingly mumbles. Been telling these like you're a footy lad, have you? Chrissy grimaces and takes a swig of vodka. Bradford AFC all the way. Jack asks with an air of anger and disappointment. Bradford C, Bradford C, Bradford C. Squiddy chants while ferociously pumping his fist into the air. Suddenly, his demeanour switches and his face turns straight. Is he fuck? He tells Jack. Jack has revelled in the delight of finally knowing another Bradford fan, having been bullied during his time at Escaldefranogwen for supporting such a minnow of a club. With Chrissy, 
and his dream local alliance, now proven a sham. Jack glares bitterly his way. Quite the sober student radicaliser over here. Couldn't you dive right there on his gear? Certainly thought so. A menace to the vulnerable, a wise district judge once claimed. Squiddy looks around the room. Went a bit far, didn't you, though? Keeping his room the same. Squiddy drops the books back on the shelf, miraculously still leaving a vantage point for the hidden camera. I mean, fuck it, actually. Why not? Family didn't give enough of a rat's ass to come and get anything themselves. Squiddy piercingly grins and stares into Chrissy's eyes. He even got away with this one. Lives to tell the tale in the boy's old room. <laughs> no cops or nothing. Fair play to the lad. Fucking leave it, Chrissy fiercely warns. It's sound though. He's over the worst of it. Three week valium binges. A thing of the past. Squiddy chugs Jack's vodka and coke. Won't happen to any of you. Unless he gets back on the dealing. To spare any further blushes, Chrissy takes action by storming up and sucker punching Squiddy from the side, knocking him out cold. Thomas pulls up outside his house, miserable after a clearly awkward, unsuccessful interview for a post office managerial job, one he zoomed straight to a mere half hour after landing back in the UK. Stuck for any other clothing options, he arrived in what is now an undersized blue tuxedo jacket. Little did he know that his recently acquired beer belly made him look a clown in the thing. A factory belief sealed his gloomy fate before a question was asked. To make matters worse, a huge sold for sale sign awaits him, as well as 25 bin bags of his stuff sprawled out on the front lawn. Shaz had a productive two weeks in Thomas's absence. When a buyer swooped in after three days of the house's listing, she bit their hand off to set herself up financially for life and move back home to Bickerton, where she belongs. Thomas knew deep down this could happen one day, with Shaz owning all rights to the house. However, his complacency quashed any doubts over the years. Worst case scenario, he envisaged bagging a chunk of the sale. Thomas rams his key into the lock, only to see it jam. Hoping to leave the buyers with a problem of their own to sort, he boots the front door and screams, setting off the whirling burglar alarm. Left with no other choice, Thomas flattens the car's back seat and stuffs his life's luggage into the boot, obliterating his dangling DIY sound system wiring. Having survived a sketchy motorway drive with obscured side and backward visibility, he heads for a dingy roadside bed and breakfast. By the second day there, his cheap, value rooms filthy long before tucking into the day's second £20 Chinese takeaway. Crates worth of Foster's cans add to the stack, including luggage built up so high that it blocks the bottom 30% of the wall-mounted TV. Thomas lies miserably on the narrow single mattress while Jim White's talk sports show plays off the telly. He begrudgingly opens the last can of Foster's, loathing the inevitability of a trek out to get more, given the area's lack of alcohol delivery services. Two Russian men explode in a fierce argument next door, heard crystal clear through the paper-thin walls. This soon evolves into a gnarly fistfight as a woman harrowingly shrieks at the top of her voice. Loud thudding rattles Thomas's wall as one of the brawlers is tackled into it. He sighs, chucks some beer and turns up the telly, praying the chaos won't exceed yesterday's 50 minute runtime. Overwhelmed by the demands on his wilting body, Skillin's taking his first rest day of the mission, bringing him and Gittles 12 day session streak to an end. Not that there's much choice, with his serotonin sapped soul only complicating nasty vertigo when walking. Such frailties make simply heading out for shopping a no-go, and with base camp no longer counting as an official address, even a barbecue chicken pizza takeaway is out of contention. On the closest thing they have to a sofa, Skillin lies vacantly in a bookshelf, scrolling through his phone when he opts for a spell of live Chrissy surveillance. Great timing. He jolts up in excitement, scraping his head on the shelf, having caught Chrissy and Sophie right in the thick of it. Their planted camera proving perfectly placed for Skillin to indulge his eyes on Chrissy shagging Sophie from behind. A strange mark on Sophie's leg revolts him, and unable to walk back into the action, he zooms in and closely examines the scar. 
while initially slow in cottoning on. Skilling soon grasps the potential for leverage here. Just the ammunition needed to smash a gaping hole in Chrissy's new life. Skilling relishes his first true contribution to the cause, especially getting to break the news to Connor. Whether achieved through blackmail or not remains to be seen. Something for Skilling to dwell his dangerously bored, depleted self over tonight. Squiddy lies passed out on the kitchen floor. Still out cold from Chrissy's sucker punch 15 minutes later. A small blood trail leads from Sam's old room, where he was dragged face down from by his legs in Chrissy's desperate attempt to revive the party's vibe. Copious collective panic attacks ensured nobody took Chrissy up on an apologetic free takeaway. All dashed home to throw up and compile righteous, multi platform social media posts, chronicling the first dash of violence of their sheltered lives. Not that Chrissy and Sophie overly mind with it providing an unexpected opportunity for Chrissy to finally give her one from behind, something he's been chomping at the bit for a chance to do. Sophie's wild, exaggerated moaning partly contributes to Squiddy's rude awakening. He grunts as his eyes slowly flicker open and stumbles back into the bin on standing. After eventually regaining composure, Squiddy squares towards Chrissy's room. Undeterred by his precarious vulnerability, he plants two sucker punches downwards as Chrissy lays back, starry-eyed, fresh from the orgasm of a lifetime. Sophie screams as Squiddy scoops the room's ashtray fag dims into his hand and storms out. Despite visceral embarrassment regarding his black eye and barely noticeable chipped tooth, Chrissy wakes up the next day and braves it out to Marks and Spencer's for his weekly shop, the only place he'll now go for food. Plenty of apples and bananas for the smoothie machine are among a mound of fruit and veg items. Lastly, he puts down an exotically coloured, frilly bouquet of flowers for Sophie. 6786, please. After a swift contactless tap, Chrissy's horrified to see his card declined. What a fucking disaster. He should have hundreds in there after two paychecks this week. Especially with the only additional outgoing being £50 on streaming services to please Sophie who's long berated him for his subscription service rigidity in only having Amazon Prime. Chrissy abandons the shopping and bombs it home, distraught to be left with a measly frozen pepperoni pizza of squiddies. Despite the inevitable incoming wrath, Chrissy pops the stingy topping pizza in the oven while patiently waiting in a nationwide customer service queue, delicately balancing the phone between his shoulder and ear. Hello, this is Jay from Nationwide. My apologies for any delays in our service today. Um, I'm speaking to Christopher. Loud roaring from Squiddy's room blurs Chrissy's hearing. He shuffles out into the backyard and lights a fag. Hi, is there anyone there? Don't go. Fuck's sake. Only an hour and a half to get through. Okay. My apologies for that. How can I help you today, Christopher? Um, yeah, uh, my account has been frozen. Let me just look into that. Jay restlessly adds. Ah, yes. There is a pending fraud investigation into suspicious activities on your account. You what? I can't tell you any more than that, Christopher, but rest assured, your frozen funds will be made immediately available to you upon the investigation's conclusion. Breaking any submission to the demands of his harrowing come down, Skilling summons Chin after breakfast for a spontaneous sesh on the rum at Gittos. Knowing the lightweight will be reluctant, they hand Gitto a full bottle of lambs at the door, which swiftly quashes any qualms. After smashing through three quarters of their bottles each within a couple of hours, Skilling gleefully recalls the last few days of Chrissy gossip while crushing up a rock of high purity MDMA. Hey mate, and he fucking rides a little, little love poems in that as well, don't he? Skilling asks Chin. What? Chrissy fucking Bray? Gitto looks away in blurry bewilderment. Chin flicks out his phone with a picture of the poem, but can't read more than a couple of words without howling. You do it, Skill. Skilling gladly obliges, buzzing for his first stab at a poetry recital since primary school assembly. Curse my life before you, wicked and oblique. Thought I was the bollocks, but out of disguise, I was just meek. He swigs rum straight from the bottle. All that bullshit bravado, insecure and brash. But not anymore, Sophie. My tough streak, you have smashed. Skilling and Chin cry out in high-pitched, barely audible laughter while Gitto scowls, thoroughly shocked to the core. A sense of resentment overcomes him, 
resentment at having looked up to someone capable of such sickening, soppy drivel. Skilling heads out to the nearby 7-Eleven shop for a boost top-up, place far pricier than Asda, which sits only 200 extra metres away, but with Connor paying, a few extra quid to save a 200 metre trek seems trivial. He holds bottles of Sailor Jerry's rum and Potoki vodka, torn between the two. Mixing vodka with the rum just sunk will surely provide the most immediate satisfaction. But another two days curled up in a ball, stuck in the horrible squat, hardly bears considering. High-pitched bells rattle on the shop door as Sophie enters. Good evening, Miss Sophie. Manny, the suave, young Asian shopkeeper, says with a cheeky grin, long having fancied his chances with her. Evening, Squire. Sophie half-heartedly replies without looking his way. Well, my day just got better. Manny adds. Now, this gets Sophie's attention, and she peeks back with flittering eyes befitting of her flattery en route to the wine section. Skillin's head's completely gone. Slightly nervous for his big moment, he gazes manically through the booze section as Sophie trawls through the wine, meticulously tallying up the least scammy of all prices. After Sophie eventually settles for two bottles of rosé, Skillin pays for a litre of gin in such a rush to follow her down a dark, quiet alleyway that he gifts Manny the seven pounds change. Ready for action, he whacks up his white and gold hoodie's hood, lightly grabs her arm, shoves her against the wall and rips out her headphones. Fucking let me go. Now. Oh, yeah. My partner will tear you a new one. Only wanted an update on matey Shiner. Do anything to me. Be more than a Shiner you'll be dealing with. Skidden looks away with a condescending smirk and turns back. Look, you grand. Won't go near you with that sordid mess on your leg. You fucking what? I can filter it out on my phone, see, when I'm watching you at it. Skillin slowly lets go of Sophie. She spits in his face and scampers away, and Skillin's eyes flare up, highly turned on by her fiery, fearless attitude. Nice meeting you. He wipes the spit off his face, takes a swig of vodka, and proudly struts off. Lugging a stacked plate of steaming hot chicken wings, Chrissy merrily bumbles back into Sam's old room. His joy is short-lived, however, as Sophie chucks her belongings furiously into a hold or bag. Have a nice laugh with the boys, did you? Telling them about my past. Sophie snarls. Chrissy tentatively places down the plate. Fuck's going on here? Only fucking weasel I've told is you. They'll all be googling it now, I bet. Sophie, satanic torture, North Wales. And they'll find it. First thing that comes up. Sophie's parents' tendency to ship their only child off during summers wildly backfired after a two-month spell at a summer camp run by lacklustre alcoholic mountaineers at 13. They'd let the children do as they so desired after their set morning activity routine while they sat back, chugged buckfast and smoked hash in the cabin. This negligent behaviour enabled Sophie the chance to sneak off daily and after a chance encounter with two unassuming lads at Real Skate Park, she was groomed into a satanic cult who burnt their emblem into her leg for initiation. Babe, you've lost me. Get fucked giving it all large that you're no longer a rotter and you let some greasy little drip fill us fucking. Be exactly why you point me up against that unsightly flag so I can't see their little heads poking through the window filming it. Who are you on about, Soph? Tell me now. It's fine. Just promise that if you make any money from it that you ping me over a taste. Sophie unloads a barrage of stiff punches, barely moving Chrissy yet opening cuts above his eye and upper lip. Spend yours at the fucking dentist. Once she starts aiming for his precious teeth, Chrissy grabs Sophie's wrists and lands a savage backhand slap that draws blood from her mouth. Sophie swiftly leaves after spitting blood on and kicking the fridge. While somewhat dismayed, on the forefront of Chrissy's mind isn't the demise of his first stable relationship, nor confusion over the circumstances, but that of how yet another bashed up face will look. With tomorrow's afternoon bistro shift looming, he spends the entire night chain-smoking blunts and compulsively checking the bruising level every half an hour. By morning, he makes an executive decision to call up sick. Bistro eyes owner and manager, Gerald, lies in a state of pure bliss. An aggressive back massage off a Thai masseuse is just what the doctor ordered to kickstart a weekend on the piss at Blackpool Darts. 
any glimmer of peace evaporates the second he spots Chrissy ringing, who, despite being a top worker, Gerald simply cannot stand. Not only down to the constant arse licking, but also because of his own fragile ego. Gerald feels routinely upstaged by Chrissy and his desire to dominate the room through humour and charisma. In truth, he's not stopped kicking himself for failing to lay the lad off after two weeks of probation. Eye infection. Gerald mutters with a colossal scowl. He raises his hand and the masseuse stops digging into his back. I suppose. It won't look great, will it? I do hope you've been keeping a hygienic home. Self-inflicted, I bet. Unprofessional, if you ask me. Sky of timing could not be worse. Sporting a classic self-shaved grade one all over hairdo, Chin perches eagerly by Chrissy's door having snuck off from Mikey's room, listening in on the entire conversation while carefully sipping a bottle of Bex. First shift and he's by himself? Chrissy says in a panic. Chin gleefully beams. Wow, er, uh, well, what I can tell you is that Tuesdays have been proper steady lately. Won't scare him off, I'm sure. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll be giving Graham the ultimate induction as soon as I'm back. Chrissy assures Gerald as Chin swaggers back into the debauchery of the kitchen's 48-hour deep sesh. Warren, Brandon, Jasmine and her industrial, fierce 17-year-old friend Cody sit around a table at Bistro I. All are dressed in uncharacteristically smart clothing, chinos and crew neck knits for the lads and respectable dresses for the girls. Warren and Brandon have their hair gel to the side in pathetic attempts at comb-overs. They pick at their chicken wing starters, of which there are eight servings as well as four apiece of chips and onion rings, and devour their 750 milliliter bottles of Lefe. With all used to little skippy piss quality beer, two bottles of 7% Lefe each already has them tipsy, loud and abrasive. The catalogue of botched pint pouring attempts has left the tidy tablecloth with a plethora of stains. Warren meticulously rolls a fag from the crumbs of his tobacco pouch, dropping most of the dust into the slowly drying beer stains. Their ingenuous, lanky waiter sporting a long blonde side fringe edges nervously towards their table. Give me the red salt, now. Cody demands as she reaches over the table and knocks over Brandon's leffe. Cody fucking monged, man. Brandon shouts before quickly simmering down as Graham approaches. Graham, how are you, lad? Jasmine theatrically asks. Well, this will no doubt be of a uh, disappointment, but we are out of peri-peri chicken. Warren slaps the table and hangs his head in his hands. No way! Knew something like this would happen. Never has Warren had anything else bar chicken from a restaurant before. Something he doesn't particularly feel strongly about changing any time soon. Don't know anything else on the menu, though, no. Brandon carefully examines the menu before blowing out his cheeks and shaking his head. All gonna have to have a lobster Newburgs, Graham Law. He ponders momentarily. You and your fucking Newburgs, man. Eight of them should do. Warren turns to Graham. Don't be bringing me that. What well, issues with our suppliers mean we can only offer two lobster Newburgs per order. Yes! Joke shop. Brandon tosses the menu across the table, knocking two chicken wings off a plate with its corner. Graham cringes at the ever developing chicken grease turning parts of the tablecloth see through. You're a disgrace, Graham. You know that. Jasmine says, snapping Graham out of his OCD induced trance. Gonna have to be four X El Kebab burger meals. Four more lefties as the drinks. Warren quietly shrieks and rubs his head in utmost frustration, not helped by his 35 minute cutter's choice drought. Whispering angels as well, yeah? Brandon rolls his eyes. Four of them as well. Graham stands there awkwardly, painfully struggling to force out his words. Sure. I'm just wondering, would they usually take proof of ID and a deposit? You know, for it being such a hefty order. What do you mean, ID? BMX silver medal at the Olympics is my ID. Uh-oh. I might just phone the boss. Graham slowly backs away, hoping to keep his mini meltdown under wraps until out of sight in the kitchen. Don't embarrass yourself, Graham, mate. Chris is here every day. His boss knows us. And the thousands we spend in here. Brandon bluntly adds. Won't be long. Graham politely smiles and scuttles off to the kitchen. Warren theatrically imitates Graham's footsteps as he heads to the nearest window. In the second the kitchen door shuts, Warren cracks it open and lights a fag with his head stuck out. 
Chrissy pants heavily with static tears in his eyes while awkwardly slumped upright on Sam's old bed. A decade-long abstinence has been obliterated as red raw knife wounds sit pretty on his shoulder once again. Never did he expect to break this promise to himself. One made after taking the anguish of being dumped for a crusty local level book DJ out on his own arms and legs. Exhilaration from the cut sting as sliced, gushing endorphins around his hapless soul has proven somewhat of a temporary release for all the pent-up self-loathing. When this soon wears off, all he can think about are the early days, back when a self-harm routine commenced in the faintest of hopes his mother might hear him grimace and rush to his aid. But she never did. A daily 7pm 30mg Valium sunk down with a few double-spiced rums kept her dozy, day and night with any energy left being shoved into a hyper-focus on Don's needs. Chrissy's subtle cries regarding mental health issues stayed well and truly unheard as a result. A situation that only intensified after being moved out to the garden shed at 11. Having already gone all out, Chrissy decides tonight is the time he says fuck this and finally caves in on his half-year cocaine drought. Months on the relative straight and narrow fly out the window as he bashes up a line next to the bloody knife just used to slice his stricken shoulder. With three college essays due in the coming days, another cash point trip will be necessary, especially at the pace he's flying through this gram. Squiddy's low-level talcum powder stuffed gear will have to do, for now. A gram for each essay all-nighter might just cut it. Unwilling to tuck into his food out of principle, Warren slouches back in his seat, fresh from caning a fat skunk and hash King L spliff, while the others gorge on their feasts. Cody, Brandon and Jasmine boast on about each other's criminal convictions, or lack of. I reckon, yeah, Cody's getting sent down first out of all of us. Brandon confidently claims. Nah. Cody snarls. Hasn't even been on probation though, no? Jasmine points out. Warren spots Graham outside, blowing smoke rings into the air, lost in his own dreamy world. Yeah, but she's by far the biggest dafty. Hey, now, now, let's fucking bounce. Warren leaps out of his seat. Brandon jumps up and heads towards the back door, while Jasmine and Cody take their escape in a leisurely manner. What about this? Cody points at the mounds of various food and drinks still left. Take the beer then. Quick. Brandon and Warren anxiously wait on the tip of their toes as Cody throws the food remnants in a carrier bag and Jasmine frantically searches for the wine bottle caps. Swiftly losing patience with the slugs, Warren and Brandon bomb it out into the pre-planned exit point and over the place's slightly arced shed roof. Warren jumps onto the wall and flamboyantly flicks his leg over the fence. His jump's wild, uncontrolled trajectory sends him within a whisker of slicing an arm on barbed wire instead catching his jumper's sleeve as he dangles a few feet off the floor. Brandon giggles as Warren carelessly flails his arm to release himself, further ripping the jumper. Jasmine makes her way out and pokes her head over the wall, seething to see the rest walking off. Wait there now! Jasmine carefully reaches up, places the beer and wine bottles on the roof, edges her way over and sprints after the crew. Marshalled by Brandon, they take the dingy, needle-ridden pathway over Bangor Mountain to get us Maeskerchan flat, as staunchly instructed. Chin and Skillin nervously await, and after they arrive and outlay their triumph, Chin sits back and lights a cigarello cigar, thoroughly relieved. Reaping havoc at Chrissy's place of work has gone to plan. Boy, did those delinquent drips deliver. They change back into their standard roadman tracksuits returning the clothing lent to them by Chin and Skillin. All items bought with their MDMA profits from TK Maxx specifically for the job. Following meticulous investigation, Chin's fuming to spot the rip on Warren's borrowed jumper. As Warren and Brandon trundle back in from the bathroom, Chin's waiting with a fierce glare, desperate to throttle the disrespectful dingler. Skillin and Gittle sit back and chuckle, Gleefully awaiting the rollicking soon flying Warren's way. What's this? Chin asks, pointing to the rip jumper. Oh, I dunno, yeah. Warren lobs the greasy carrier bag of leftover food on Gittle's bed. How do you not know? Oh, mate, they're gimpy little clothes. Who gives a fuck? 
He turns away, unable to maintain eye contact. No. Chin slowly takes four packets of fags out of the sleeve as he talks. They're business assets. Chin passes the ravaged sleeve of fags to Warren. Each were promised a full carton for their work. Jasmine and Cody stumble out of the bathroom, now changed into bright pink tracksuits and chugging wine from the bottle. Chin passes a full sleeve of fags over to Brandon, who examines it in awe, having never seen so many fags in one place. Warren stares at the missing packets and grunts. How about, yeah, I have the extra fags for fucking makeup fees and all that grub I bought back for you? Cody confidently proposes. Chin pedantically opens the food bag with the tip of his finger and grimaces at the messy doner meat, chicken wing and onion ring mashup. Gitos springs up off the bed. That's food! Get that greasy shit off my bed, now! Warren lobs the bag out of the window and its contents sprawls out on the edge of the already unkempt, weedy pavement. Over the next few days, seagulls and pigeons form a mini colony of grateful scavengers, all picking at the food until a street sweeper blows it away. Chapter 6 Bring Keg In After a few weeks of solid graft, Skillins accumulated quite the local customer base, especially among the ravers of Bangor, who through word of mouth now flock to bag some of his A-grade MDMA before nights at Hendra Hall and Fat Cat. A rough, boarded-up old community centre opposite Gittel's house serves as their go-to customer meet-up hotspot. Every day at 3 and 7pm, Skillin operates a no-appointment-necessary system, and such is its popularity that he's routinely met by over 20 people at a time. Suppressing the urge to request they move their lucrative meeting spot away from the family house, Gitter has become increasingly involved in the business, with a lifetime first hefty paycheck clouding his better judgement. Skillin effectively moved into Gittles after a spell of pleurisy caused by their squat's damp conditions. Warned by Chin about leaving traces of their presence in the area, this episode of illness is dragged on, given the lack of medical intervention. As a compromise, Skillin's prescribed himself with the heating of Gittles' toasty home, a luxury allowed owing to Jean's lack of energy use stinginess. It's a win-win for Skillin with only a mere 10 metres separating him from work. Not only that, but the place serves as a vantage point for observing Chrissy's ever-increasing despondency as he passes daily on walks to Taliban. Chin, meanwhile, remains firmly focused on the task at hand, and after running out of use for the boy, his presence at Gitto's parties has dwindled. Struggling to keep his eyes open after two sleepless days, Chin pulls up outside of Chrissy's in the people carrier, just as the clock turns 3am. He clicks on a phone document titled Work and College Schedule, and zooms in on the next day, which states, Bistro, 6am to 9am, College, 10am to 3pm, Harp, 5pm to 10pm. Perfect. He's timed it just late enough so that Chrissy won't get back to sleep before his 5.15am alarm. For the fourth night running, Chin smirks, opens the car windows, and blasts the hardest button to button by the white stripes through the car's modified stereo. It's not long before Chrissy's room light flickers on, quickly followed by Squiddy poking his head out of the top floor window with a grizzled glare. Squiddy dashes away and returns with four glass bottles as he lobs at Chin's car. As glass trickles in through the open sunroof, Chin hurtles off. Chrissy's distraught to have been picked as the first to deliver his class presentation. Discerning glares have flown his way from all angles on his first day back at college after waiting for his face wounds to heal. Stumbling through his first few slides of the hierarchy of credibility, he eventually finds some momentum, having found a way to keep Sophie, Lucas and Bev out of eyeshot. And in the absence within these small areas of accessible experts, your typical positive influencers, Chrissy attempts to stifle his cold sweat by ripping off his striped Tommy Hilfiger jumper. His cocaine habit's recent resurgence and a lingering three-day-old comedown only adds to his nervous, sweaty outpour. Down to the force of his jumper's removal, he briefly reveals his shoulders, 
And while most aren't paying attention to the stuttering presentation, Gwen fixates on the fresh, thin red knife wounds. Our unofficial local expert, i.e. in this case, a dealer, develops unbridled power to define to their customers and skeptics of their unsavoury ways what is true. They'll say things like, that it's all right to smash a load of Valium when you've been coked up a few days, and it's sound just to sell a little bit of gear. If it's to your mates, you're helping him out, because it's my bulk you're selling him, the good stuff. And if you don't, they'll just be getting baby powder down the road. Lucas scoffs. He's heard enough. Shame your victims aren't here to benefit from such empowering matter. A scattering of audible sniggering ripples through the classroom as Chrissy clenches his fists. Never in the past would he put up with such lip and humiliation. But being painfully close to the course's end, he just about keeps a lid on it. Gwen sternly glares at Lucas bit rich coming from the walking encyclopedia of illegal football streams. Still scamming delivery three times a week, I presume? Burger fell apart in the bag? Lucas's righteous smirk vanishes as he sinks drearily into his seat. On a rare night back at the squat, Skillin's fast asleep, rinsed full of Valium to help dream his way through the come down of his latest seven day speed and ketamine binge. Having ploughed through Connor's cocaine handout, Skillings resorted to getting speed by the ounce off the Barnevelt brothers in Rachib. Not that he needs to. They're financially secure for the rest of the mission and have long obtained their primary objective from the dealing, getting their dirty claws into Chrissy's life through his peers. However, Skillings fallen off the rails without his alpha male, older relatives keeping him in line. Chintz certainly thinks so, and fearing they'll be replaced for the job. He's kept news of Skillin's scatty state to himself. Llewellyn, Tick and Shane raucously devour a bottle of gin in a nearby shop doorway. For hours on end, they've relived what feels like their lives worth of fighting scenarios with passionate running commentary to Chin's sleep-deprived fury. After Skillin passed out on his carefully curated, makeshift bed with a £1.50 charity shop sofa cushion, he's been left with a single, half-inch thick exercise mat and Skillin's sweaty, inferior sleeping bag. Fearing Skillin's grizzled come-down state without a deep snooze, he's refrained from dragging the boy out head first on this occasion. Three cracks from the back door send shockwaves through Chin's spine. After another, he jumps up, turns on a battery-powered lamp, tiptoes over to Skillin's bed and vigorously shakes him by the shoulders knowing only an almighty effort snaps him out of his deep Valium kip. Skill! Skillin! Chin shouts. Chin slaps Skillin around the face, and he partially opens his red eyes in a dizzy daze. Glass shatters from the back room, and within seconds, Ben and Squiddy burst in as Skillin stumbles to his feet. Where are your fucking tunes now? Squiddy roars. Ben heads straight for Chin while Squiddy rains down repeated ferocious power hooks on Skillin's head. Only three are needed to send Skillin crashing back to sleep by clattering his head into the wall, chipping the wilted plastering before sprawling out on the floor. After an even exchange of hooks at close quarters, Chin rocks Ben with an uppercut to the jaw that sends him stumbling backwards. Squiddy charges in and knees are now cornered Chin on the side of the head. A trickle of blood drips down his cheek as he fights to keep his footing. Banger's mine, mate. No more grafting, no more tunes. Ben gouges Chin's eye, who takes the pain well, considering. Better not make me have to remind you. Squiddy revels in Chin's vulnerability and picks up an open box of crystal MDMA, one skilling carelessly left open after a cheeky few keys before crashing out. Blam! Squiddy merrily waves the bag. Ben turns back on the way out and boots Chin in the gut as he leans against the wall off balance. Squiddy lands a parting dollop of phlegm right on Chin's head as he cowers in the corner. Fulfilled by their night's work, Ben and Squiddy strut off for a night of free lines when after somehow finding a second wind, Chin spits out a chunk of blood, takes a deep breath and with all his strength, Chin ushers them over with a steely, wild glare. Fucking come on then, both of you. First, he goes for Squiddy, and a flush hook on the jaw sends him flailing backwards out through the battered glass door and onto the roof ledge. Not one for a feeling out process, 
Chin continues the momentum by landing a stiff jab on Ben's temple. Entirely unmoved, Ben fires back as they trade gnarly hooks. And after a brutal 30 second brawl, Chin rocks Ben for the first time. Ben wipes his twitching, bloody eyes as he stumbles backwards. Spluttering and sensing defeat, he whacks out a small knife hidden in his sock. While Ben's exemplary fist-fighting skills mean it's rarely brandished, he cannot stand the thought of losing a fight, and having met his match, he stabs Chin in the shoulder. After edging back to the door, Ben runs off, leaving Squiddy sprawled out in the cold, alone. This is a final warning the boys duly take, despite Skillin's valium-clouded memory sparing him all but a few blurry moments of the ordeal. Chin insists that after Skillin sold his last few grams, they're finished with the dealing. To ensure this is adhered to, Chin confiscates Skillin's bank card and limits him to a £40 daily cash allowance. Thudding from the front door suddenly jolts Jean out of a pleasant wet dream. But owing to get old scallywag mates' routine 4am door hammering, she doesn't burst up with any urgency. By the time she's halfway down the stairs in her pink dressing gown, it becomes apparent that these are no scallywags, and she takes caution. A queue of raid policemen gathered behind the door give a 20 second warning to step aside before smashing their way in with a baton. Led by a bald headed, scowling brute of a copper, six fully kitted raid officers storm in all directions of the house while screaming, Police! While somewhat unnerved, She's long been warned by her entire romance reading club regarding the perils of Gittor's recent associations. Knowing it'll soon be over, she puffs on the day's first of many Richmond fags and vacantly stares into space as officers chuck the room's content over the floor. Her youngest son, Mabon, wobbles in with terror in his eyes. Jean urges. Gerald miserably sifts through a mountain of paperwork at his oversized desk after a rare holiday blighted by work-related distractions. Chrissy half-heartedly knocks on the office door, with Gerald concluding only a knock with more conviction is worth his acknowledgement. After an awkward minute of waiting, Chrissy tentatively enters. Chrissy, Gerald sarcastically says. Gerald, how's the new pool treating you? Chrissy asks. Gerald slaps down the paperwork and sighs. I've been, uh, I've been having some trouble financially. Problems with the bank and that, and, uh, well, see, I'm, uh, I'm proper strapped until payday. Right. Is there a chance at all you could, uh, do me an advance? Gerald grimaces. Well, we've had a bit of a wacky week here. What with the buckets of cancelled reservations? I was only thinking, uh, maybe a wanna, if that's okay. Gerald grits his teeth. Not only that, but over the four days you've had on the sick, we've had no less than four different groups of duck and dark.